wonderful robotic sound, isn't it? It's pleasant to know that the government is watching you. Okay, I was joking, sorry. Okay, see, this is why I get myself in trouble for recording stupid things. I will definitely be cutting this out somehow, maybe. Okay, so let's deal with the central dogma. This is your topic D. This is your material that is going to go for the second exam. This is the other half. The first half was the central dogma. Uh, sorry, the cell lecture. And so now we're going into central dogma. These guys go hand in hand simply because kind of one tells you what's going on in the bigger scale. The other one tells us what's going on in the inside or smaller scale of the cell. So up to topic B, we did a lot of chemistry and we did all those macromolecules and we learned how to build them. And so now we're gonna actually take those macromolecules and expand them in detail. So not only we're gonna go see them from the perspective of a cell and look at them from the point of view that the cell comes in many flavors, but flavors more than anything else that are interesting to us because it's microbiology. And so we're gonna look at the so-called central dogma, this idea of how things are uh, transmitted in terms of genetic information and how do we go from a series of instructions to a final product and then i'll try and try and give you examples along the way so we're going to start backwards we're going to start with the concept of a protein and go from there now since we're going to start with proteins that's really where we want to focus that's kind of our end point of our central dogma it's probably the more important part from topic b and from topic c we kind of reminded you that um, all our proteins are made up of these little monomers uh, called amino acids, and that they build these cool little polymers called polypeptides. And you learned in topic C that those are made by the ribosomes, are part of their rough ER, for example. Um, and that one big message that I try to tell everybody, they do everything. They're pretty much multifunctional, and they're really the workers of all cells, right? And so, um, one of the key features that are going to learn today more than anything else is that that multifunctionality, that ability for them to do really cool stuff is largely based on their shape. Proteins do things on how they're really uh, arranged three dimensionally. But what we're going to learn now is how do they get that shape? How do you make them? How do you build them? Where do they come from kind of thing, right? and uh, what is their composition. So that's what this topic is, starting from the central dominance point of view. So that's the plan, what we're gonna do. So hang in there. All right, so the central dogma itself, right? It's actually kind of simple. It's kind of a one-liner in which it tells us that it's pretty much how all living things arrange themselves from instructions to becoming alive. In other words, it's kind of the order and more or less the origin of the genetics of all living things. And so you have that statement that tells you up there, it's the source and order of all genetic information into function. So what it's telling us is how do we go from a blueprint to something useful? And so there's three main pieces that everybody should be familiar with, which are the three, uh, two of the main uh, pieces of macromolecules that are three parted. DNA and RNA, which are our nucleic acids, and then protein, which happens to be our uh, polypeptide version from our macromolecules lecture. So it's DNA, RNA, protein. DNA being, in this case, the main set of instructions that are relatively complex, and you have an mRNA or RNA piece that is the decoding portion of this, the, part that, uh, the portion that makes sense out of that DNA and then the proteins themselves, which are the final product. And as we established enough times, um, proteins do everything, so they are the functional pieces. So what the central dogma is really telling you is how do we get proteins? What happens first? What are the steps? Where do they come from? That's what the central dogma is. It's the order and source. How do we make things functional in living things? And what's also really unique, it's kind of a little vicious cycle. So you can't have uh, more DNA without protein. You can't have RNA without protein. And technically, you can't even have proteins without proteins. So it, they are all self-reinforcing. So for that, I usually have some sort of doodle available for you guys, right? And so um, I've drawn a very, very basic eukaryotic cell up there. So remember that eukaryotes have a nucleus, so therefore their DNA is enclosed. That's what we're learning in topic C, right? Right? 
And so the DNA typically is enclosed in something, contained in something, whether it be a nucleus, or if it's in bacteria, it's called a nucleoid region. And then you convert that into RNA and then follow it into protein. But the DNA itself, the key feature is just like anything else, you need to be able to make more of it. You can't just have free floating DNA and then suddenly pass it on to somebody, you die. So you need to be able to replicate it. You need to be able to duplicate that DNA. And more than anything else, as we'll learn at the end of the topic, it needs to be done with high amounts of accuracy. You don't want to make mistakes in copying the blueprint. It should be self-evident, right? You don't want to make mistakes when uh, copying down instructions on somebody to follow. Think about that classic case of asking somebody for directions that doesn't follow the same way of um, explaining them and you get lost. Same idea. You need to have somebody that gives you exquisite, detailed instructions on how to build something. And that's what DNA is, instructions. So you need to be able to replicate them accurately with high fidelity. And so that process of making more copies of DNA is our first step in the central dogma. It's replication. Now, that DNA then needs to be decoded into something we can more or less follow along, something more legible, something more understandable. And so the process of decoding the DNA or turning it into something useful is called transcription. So converting step one to step two, DNA to RNA, that process is transcription. And you'll see me abbreviate it as TCR or TXN, depending on which folks like to abbreviate in which ways. And then that RNA, now that we understand the blueprint itself, then we can convert it into something useful. We can build whatever we intend to build out of it. And that process is called translation. And so the final product is what we call a protein or technically a polypeptide. And that's our third and final step. So the central dogma has three components, DNA, RNA, and protein, as we just mentioned in the previous slides. And it has three main processes, and replication, transcription, and translation. And I told you also in the previous slide that it's a cycle. That cycle is because the fact that the protein is the one that does all these steps as well. Proteins are the ones that do everything, remember? So proteins will be the ones that do replication, proteins are gonna be the ones that do transcription, and so on and so forth. And so I'm giving you the names in there. Now, one of the things I want you to start noticing, at least for my lectures, is that I like to kind of color code things. Not only do I like to doodle, but I usually like to kind of keep things in the same pattern. And so what you'll see is I'll do my best that I'll keep all the things that I deal with DNA when I'm drawing them in blue, you know, kind of like a blueprint, right? And then protein, you'll always see it in green as best as I can draw. So kind of follow those along. You'll see me do that as best as I can, mind you. Sometimes we just can't avoid them. Okay, so let's start off with those proteins, right? That's the part where we wanna kind of focus on material. So protein in this case, the reason why we look at this is because again, they're multifunctional. And you've probably already known this even without taking a micro class or an AMP class or anything of that sort. You've probably heard about protein simply because of diets or because you read it on you know, some box of food or because you bought some sort of pro uh, project, sorry, uh, product that tells you, ah, well, this helps repair proteins on your hair or something like that. Everybody's been exposed to that concept, but why? Why is it so important? Well, believe it or not, every living thing, the greater majority of their composition is protein because they do everything. So um, if you look at humans, for example, most of you, aside from being bone and fluid, is muscle. And all of that muscle is protein. You've heard that before. And so for the same reason that you're going to bite on a piece of chicken or turkey or something like that, that's also muscle that you're consuming. And so that's protein, right? Protein in this case is about moving things. But your skin, for example, the keratinocytes and the keratin that you're producing, uh, the hair that you have in there, your nails, all that stuff is also protein as well. They serve a function, whether it's protective or some sort of um, motility or something of that sort. But then there's also proteins inside of you. Uh, for example, the ones in your stomach, one of the key ones you'll learn about, it's called pepsin. Um, you'll probably do that in AMP. That one is not really holding things together. It's not really structural. This one is more or less to do something. And this one converts stuff inside your stomach during digestion, for example. Insulin, that one's a signal instead. That one acts as a hormone. And so that one tells us when your cells 
need to be absorbing glucose or taking in glucose most uh, specifically. So they do everything and you've been hearing about these all the friggin' time. The question is, what do they do and how are they made, right? So we go back to topic B and we go back in chemistry and what we told you, things are built out of monomers and polymers and that these things called amino acids are the smallest building blocks of proteins or polypeptides. And so those amino acids uh, were composed of two main functional groups, which were uh, an amino com a component, which is in blue on that side, and then a carboxylic acid component, which is in green on that, green on that side, and then some sort of R group or variable group, which we're about to explain. So hang on to that one. Now, your proteins are chains of these. So one second here. So what's happening here is that you'll turn these into chains during dehydration synthesis. You'll, you'll remove a little bit of water and link these guys together. And so you'll build something called a polypeptide chain. Now, that chain is repetitive and it goes on for hundreds, if not thousands of these guys back to back to back to back. But that R group actually changes. And that R group, believe it or not, comes in about 20 different flavors. And so I'm gonna show them to you here in our next slide. Now, mind you, you do not need to actually uh, memorize these. This is something that we do in biochemistry most of the time, but not in microbiology. And you'll hear them. They're usually referred to as naturally occurring amino acids. And we have to establish that because now they're synthetic ones. You can actually build one. So for those of you who've ever bought a bulk protein, for example, it includes synthetic versions in there too. Now, the idea is there's 20 of them. They all have that carboxylic acid, that amino, but they have that R group that changes. And so if you look at the slide, you'll see that those uh, R groups come in all these crazy shapes. And so out of those crazy shapes, um, you'll see some variations. Some are really short, some of them are really long. Some of them happen to be very neutral or uncharged. Some of them end up being a little bit acidic or basic, for example, or alkaline, simply because of how they're built. And so we get 20 different versions of them. So those are the ones that we use. And as you'll notice that I have enclosed them in a little green square, there's nine of those guys that we are called or they're referred to as essential amino acids. Now, the reason behind this is a very simple concept. We can't make those. The other 11, we can actually build them and our cells produce them all the time. But these other nine are considered essential because we have to obtain them from our diet. In other words, if you don't consume it, you die. That's the short version of that, being a little extreme here. But So these are considered to be the nine essential amino acids. So those are the ones in the big squares, right? Now, this is something that we talk about on the side, part of our stories here, is that um, what happens when you don't obtain your amino acids. And so, for example, in your diet, by changing your diet, so by restricting what you consume, especially protein or anything else, if you decide to go, oh, well, I'm only gonna eat this type of protein or I'm not gonna consume this particular type of animal or something like that, you actually limit yourself to those. And if you actually don't get those amino acids, you will die. You won't get the amino acids you need to build the proteins you need to make your body functional. So people that go on diets, this is our biggest concern. And one of the larger concerns that we had in the past was, for example, people that resorted to plant-based diets and more or less truly going vegan or anything else because you end up restricting some of these. Some of these amino acids are not present in high amounts in some of these diets. And so people become deficient and they can have some severe health issues. So more often than not, um, people that end up going through these diets have to supplement themselves. So they have to be able to buy a little pill that contains all of these guys. And so the argument for that is that I don't need to kill a chicken or don't need to uh, murder some sort of cow or something like that to protect the environment. In reality, no, it doesn't make any difference because unless these are synthetic, those amino acids are still going to come from those sources anyway. And if you end up having a little bit of a high and mighty kind of ideal of you don't want to harm an animal, don't forget that you're still going to consume that animal because it's what turns into fertilizer anyway, and that's what feeds the plant. So you're not avoiding it in any way, shape, or form. 
So keep that in mind, okay? Now, usually my favorite story to always talk about, um, as kind of a side note, if, if you ever get a chance, is uh, for those of you who are fans of Jurassic Park, um, there's always been the, oh, they're not never gonna escape the park and never kill us, right? But if you read the books, they go in a little bit more detail about it. And there was uh, part of the original books uh, written by Michael Crichton, which was something called the lysine contingency. And lysine is one of those essential amino acids, the bottom middle one in there, right? And so the idea is the scientists, when they designed these awesome dinosaurs, is that they couldn't make that guy. And so if they weren't fed lysine, they would all die. So that means that was called the lysine contingency. If we all die, the dinosaurs all die because they don't get that amino acid. A very simple kind of security protocol. And so uh, clearly after 25 movies later, that didn't work. So you get to read those in some of the books that are out there that he wrote. So anyway, eat your, all your amino acids. And if for whatever reason you have to change your diet, make sure you're supplementing them so you obtain all of these bad boys. All right. Now, we were going to take those 20 different amino acids and build them. We're going to link them. And so remember, dehydration synthesis, we remove a hydroxyl from one side, we remove a hydrogen from the other side, and link those two together. And so we end up having some water being kind of fed off to the side. And so what that ends up looking like is this chain of amino acids with the little R groups kind of sticking off to the side. And so this is where we enter how we kind of label and describe our proteins. We describe them in steps. And so the very first time we link them, the order in which they come in is referred to as a primary structure. And that just means what order. So you describe which amino acid follows which, and that's it. So a primary structure of a protein or a primary structure of a, of a polypeptide is just the sequence of those amino acids that you're building. So which one, you know, A, B, C, or D, the order in which they come in, that's pretty much it. Now, I usually like to describe this kind of like making words, makes it easier, kind of like an alphabet. Think of trying building words by using a 20 letter alphabet instead of a 26 one, right? So there's 20 available amino acids. And so you get to combine those letters into whatever code you wanna make. So now think about trying to make words out of just 20 letters instead. The order of those letters is what we call the primary sequence. So let's think about the word protein right now, just for the sake of it. So since we're on, topic you look at the word protein and uh, especially for somebody that may have some challenges even reading that we know that exists is sometimes you don't read it correctly right and you could say something else that and which it doesn't mean but we know that the word protein says p-r-o-t-e-i-n-s and i feel lucky that i read that correctly now the idea is what if you rearrange it now we know that if it has that arrangement that sequence that primary structure it means the word protein but remember, you can have an anagram, you can rearrange those letters, and then it stops meaning that word. So it's just the sequence, just the order in which we kind of spell something out. That's the primary sequence of pro proteins, which 20 amino acids you're using. And so the example that we have up here is the order of four of those, alanine, leucine, cysteine, and methionine. That's an order, right? We can rearrange those two. We can put the cysteine first, we can put the leucine last, it doesn't matter. It's the sequence, it's the order in which they come in. That's your primary structure. Now, once we have a long enough primary structure, then they actually start folding. And so what happens is those bonds that we talked about in topic B, they start interacting. So we start forming some hydrogen bonds, some ionic bonds, um, some covalence, not in this case very much, but they start interacting and they can interact in some very unique ways. One of the ways that they interact is they form these things called helices. And they have the fancy name called an alpha helix, in which they kind of start coiling around each other. And so you can see kind of the pretty drawing with that eh, purplish color in there, right? In which those amino acids, that polypeptide chain, that primary sequence, folds around itself, and the hydrogen bonds give it this cool little coil. That's version one. A uh, version two exists in which they um, kind of start folding and then going back and forth and end up looking kind of like an accordion, like a little origami fold, if you will, in which they'll kind of go up and down, up and down, and then kind of fold upon each other. This is called a sheet, or fully uh, spelled out, it's called a beta pleated sheet. So same idea, 
the these are three dimensional arrangements of these guys. And so just to kind of compare them, compare them sorry, side by side, you have your alpha helix and your beta sheets in which these are kind of three dimensional arrangements. We call these secondary structures. Our primary was the order. Our secondary is that three dimensional shape that they start obtaining. Now that's just a couple of the versions. There's actually more of them, but these are pretty much the most common ones. There's also ones that are called random coil, in which they really have no arrangement whatsoever. Okay, so now those folds, those secondary structures that we just talked about, those helices and those sheets, can also start arranging themselves between each other. And so now we start encountering different versions of bonds. And so, for example, some of the sulfur groups on cysteines, for example, um, interact with each other and form a covalent bond called a disulfide bridge, and that holds them together. Uh, you can have more ionic bonds, you can have additional hydrogen bonds. Some of them just get together simply because they're all hydrophobic and they're trying to hide from water. And so the arrangements that you get are these really neat, bigger three-dimensional shapes in which you have lots of helices and sheets and some random coils all rearranging themselves into an overall large shape, okay? So let me show you one of them. This is one of the more infamous ones. I'll let you try and figure out which one that is. Let's make it a challenge. Um, you can see here in the cool little coils, those are your helices. You can see the big arrows, those are your pleated sheets. And you can see that it's arranged in three-dimensional space. And this is really where I start reminding you um, that shape is the most important part of our protein, aside from its composition, obviously, in which that shape dictates what it can do. So this overall three-dimensional shape of the protein is called a tertiary structure. So we had the sequence, that was our primary. We had the uh, first shapes that they start taking, which was our secondary, those alpha helices and sheets. And then we have our tertiary, our third level of arrangement in which they start folding upon each other and having additional bonds. And so this is referred to as tertiary structure. And you can see it's the kind of overall shape that they take. Now, there is an additional level of formation. It's not always the case, but it can happen. And this is referred to as a quaternary structure or the fourth level in which multiple of these kind of all hang out together. And so some proteins for them to work kind of find other versions of themselves or different versions of themselves and interact into larger complexes, bigger versions. Probably the most infamous example that I can always give you is hemoglobin. For those of you who are going to be taking AMP or are already taking it, you get to find out that wonderful little carrier of iron and oxygen that everybody needs to breathe and perform uh, metabolism is hemoglobin. And hemoglobin happens to be a four-parter. It's one polypeptide chain, one protein, that comes in repeats of four. In other words, four of them have to come together for hemoglobin to actually work. So this is what we refer to as a quaternary structure, in which you have multiple chains now interacting with each other, multiple separate chains I should establish. So if you focus on the little doodle on the bottom left hand, uh, right hand corner here, is I kind of show you all uh, four of those steps. At the bottom, I show you two different primary structures, a slightly shorter blue one and a slightly longer purple one. Okay, so that's the primary structure, just the order in which they're going. And then each one of those starts folding, and you can see them on the right hand side. Uh, the blue one turns into a helix, for example, and the purple one turns into a sheet. Okay, and so those are your secondary structures. They start interacting with those uh, hydrogen bonds typically. And then ultimately the tertiary structure, which is you're seeing smack in the middle, that guy is the overall shape that these helices and sheets all take as part of our protein. And now there is that final part, and I'll use my little laser pointer over here, in which this one piece can actually interact with other separate pieces, and which is what you're seeing over here in the middle, with an additional piece in the red which is what we refer to as a quaternary structure. These are additional separate proteins that are all interacting together, okay? So we have primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. All kind of dictate what that um, actual protein is going to do. So this is where we enter that kind of uh, 
last phase of the structure of the protein and how does it work before we actually start building them. And so as I established multiple times, its shape is key. Now I have here just some examples of some of the ones we were talking about before and then some additional ones. Our proteins kind of get arranged most of the time into their shapes. And so we have the kind of long and stringy versions of them called, referred to as fibrous proteins. Whereas we get the ones that are kind of a little bit more bubbly and circular, these are called globular proteins. And interestingly enough, there's this very strong correlation in which the stringy ones, the fibrous ones, end up being mostly structural, kind of like the thing in our hair and our skin. And more of the bubbly looking ones, the circular looking ones, the globular looking ones, end up having more active uh, functions like enzymatic ones or signals, that kind of thing. So there's a little bit of a pattern. But regardless of their shape, the key thing is, again, that secondary, tertiary, and even quaternary levels need to maintain that shape. If you disrupt the shape, they lose their function. And so the feature here is something that we call denaturation or denaturation away from its natural state. That's what that word means right? Plenty of things can disrupt proteins. And some of them you already are familiar with. You've probably been already practicing this all along. One of the most common ways to disrupt proteins is through heat. Heat happens to uh, break H bonds or hydrogen bonds um, and any type of uh, hydrophobic interaction. So it kind of dismantles proteins really fast. So do organic solvents. We'll get to those a little bit later too. We'll talk about that during uh, microbial control. Acids and bases do the same thing. Since they're a little electric, they disrupt any electric interaction. So any type of ionic interactions, they mess with them too. Uh, large metals, so heavy metal ions in this case, also break things apart. Right? And then virtually kind of combined with heat, the act of simply shaking things, or what we refer to as agitation, also breaks our proteins apart if you shake them long enough or hard enough. So now this is where we enter again our portion of the class in which we kind of give you that hands-on application or some sort of take-home application behind this. So heat, acids and bases, uh, ions and agitation are all ways of denaturing things. But again, you didn't need to know that. You already knew that. You just didn't have a name for it. You've been practicing denaturation your entire life. And so we've been kind of changing the shapes of proteins anytime we cook, for example. And since we're always alluding to food, which is the most important portion of this class apparently, um, anytime we um, put something in hot water, anytime we put, fry something on a skillet, what literally you're doing is heating it. You're transferring in this case, a massive uh, amount of heat and changing the shapes of the proteins. The same reason why we cook things is to kill bacteria, right? You're removing their ability to stay alive because you're killing their proteins, right? So that's all these kind of basic things you've been following along. And interesting here is the examples are popping up in the questions. Um, I'm gonna get a twofold over here. One of those common things that people do is, for example, uh, apply heat to their hair, right? And so anytime they do that, you're literally killing your protein and it doesn't come back. It needs to be repaired. And so clearly they'll try and sell you lots of products that say, ah, these repair hair. No, they really don't. You repair your own hair, not uh, products out there. Products can help maintain them a little bit longer, but they don't really repair them. And so as you apply heat, the keratin more than anything else that is present on your skin, as well as your hair and your nails gets disrupted. It becomes weaker, softer, brittle. For those of you who uh, paint your nails, for example, any single time you would keep on applying paint to them or more than anything else, acetone that keeps on removing it, you're destroying those proteins. And for those of you who probably practice this at some point in time, I'm not gonna call anybody out, I assume that somebody at some point in time decided to change their entire look by either straightening their hair or curling it or something in between. And they do that by using heat. The idea is you disrupt those bonds so that you can reshape them. Now, if you keep on doing that long enough, you're going to damage your hair too. But there's plenty of products that allow you to do that also. You can buy certain uh, substances that uh, allow your hair to straighten up or curl. And what they're interacting with is those cysteine uh, amino acids, those disulfide bridges 
And what happens is it breaks them apart and reassembles them. And so for those who've ever done this, you can leave your hair there in this product and then you can change its shape and it'll stay like that for, I don't know, a week, three months, six months sometimes, depending on what substance you use. That's what you're doing. You're denaturing, you're changing the shape of those proteins, right? And so um, Claudia brought this up also a little bit earlier and this is something that is pertinent to us right now. What happens um, for our viruses more than anything else? Viruses, just like everything else, requires proteins as well. So heat can break these down. So cooking things is an important concept, right? But more than anything else, heat is one of our special ways of defending ourselves. And as we will see in the very, very last topic, fevers are an important component of that. Us basically increasing the temperature of our bodies to above 100.5 or so Fahrenheit um, is us trying to cook ourselves. We're trying to denature the proteins of everything that is infecting us. Our body will naturally do that. So when we have those fevers, our body is fighting off whatever is inside of us in the hopes that we're denaturing those proteins. Now, the problem with that is that it can go a little bit out of control and it can go a little too long. If you have a fever that extends over a certain amount of time, you kind of start cooking yourself too. And to remind you, those proteins don't come back. Just like you cook the steak on, you know, on a pan. You don't reverse it back to its original state. You cook your brain, it's kind of damaged that way too. This is something that is very critical, for example, in children. When trying to control their fevers is very, very important, right? So again, we've been doing this all the time. You just didn't call it denaturation or you didn't call it science or biology or anything like that sort. We've been doing this all along. I'll be happy to give you lots of other examples outside of the recording. All right, so We'll pause here for half a second just to make sure that everybody is up to speed if, if anybody else has some questions. Okay, we'll continue here and then uh, we'll start recording again. Okay, so we just finished with the protein portion, right? And we kind of give you an example of how to, anything from how to build them to specifically how uh, their functions can vary based on their three-dimensional shape. Now to kind of remind you again, this is the final piece of the central dogma. So we're going a little bit backwards. We started with proteins first, right? And we need to know how to build them. Where do they come from? What causes them and so on and so forth. So we're gonna go back to the beginning of the uh, central dogma and remind you again a little bit more behind what we saw in uh, topic B in our second topic on this idea of how to build nucleic acids. Remind you once again that your nucleic acids are long chains of things called nucleotides, right? So for that though, usually it's kind of important to kind of give you a little bit of a preview of stuff, right? Now, mind you, this is not stuff I test you on because this is not purview of the class itself. This is more of a general biology course, maybe some AMP in there, but it's kind of important to know some of the terminology, okay? So this, consider this a little bit of an extra preview in there. One of the most common ones on the terminology of uh, genetics has to do with what's a gene, genome, that kind of thing. So just for the sake of explanation, right? This is where we're gonna start with this portion. Let's go off with a gene, okay? So the idea here is that everybody knows that they have this DNA thing, right? But your DNA is not one large portion of things. Instead, it's a collection of pieces. And just like I gave you uh, some of the examples last time, like a library, a library is this collection of information, but it's not available just all at the same time. Instead, you have to kind of access each individual piece. The same thing happens to us. Our DNA blueprint is a collection of things. We actually call that a genome. It's a collection of genes, but each individual portion is what gives us an, an individual effect. So a portion of that chunk of DNA that eventually gives us something functional is referred to as a gene. So think about that as an individual book, right, in our library. The library is the entire collection called the genome, but one book by itself is one gene. And from that one book, you get to have one experience. And in this case, one product, what we call a protein. Now out of those though, you'll also know that each library has variations on those books. Some of them are older, some of them are a little bit newer, um, some of them with updated formats, 
And so our genes don't only come in one specific code. Instead, there are small little variations inside of them, tiny little ones that make them a little different. They still perform the same job, okay, but they show it a little bit different. And so we call those genotypes. So think about if you want to uh, get a book on how to build, I don't know, a table. Well, there's tons of different ways to build a table, and it still gives you the final product, which is a table, right? And so the same applies to our genes. You can construct a gene, for example, the gene for insulin that gives you insulin. But insulin comes in different versions too. Some of them are a little bit stronger, some of them are a little bit weaker, some of them are a little weird, right? But you still get insulin. So the type that you carry is referred to as a genotype. And ultimately what is produced, that final product, what is observable and measurable, is referred to as a phenotype, right? So ultimately you can have instructions to build a table, but whether it's a six person table or an eight person table, it's still a table. And so the genotype tells you, oh, I come with a four version table, but what you produce, that final product, is that actual built table itself. That's the phenotype. Now let's put this into actual application rather than just talking about household items, right? And so we're gonna take this idea of the central dogma and make something useful, and then I'll give you a silly example as usual. So think about it this way. Every human, since we're not gonna deal with bacteria yet, we'll get to those in a second. Every single one of you guys is composed roughly of about 40 to 80 trillion cells. That's most of us, right? Somewhere in there as an adult, not as a child, mind you, okay? And yet, each individual one of those trillions of cells carries the exact same information. All the collection, our little library of genes, all of them are there. And we carry it in about 23 different pieces called chromosomes, right? So 23 different branches inside a library, if you will. That adds up to about roughly six feet worth of DNA, about two meters. Right, And inside each one of those, this individual cell, not all, not all 80 trillion, just one of those cells, you're carrying about 3 billion different pieces of DNA. Okay, Now, in those 6 feet, in those 3 billion pieces of DNA, those little subunits, humans are known to carry about 25,000 genes, 25,000 books. Think about it that way inside our library. Interestingly enough, though, that's all we need to make a human survive. That's all that needs to be there. 25,000 different books gives us a human, apparently. So, unfortunately, we know that humans are built of, of roughly 150,000 proteins, not 25,000. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy here. How is it that we can form 150,000 proteins but we only have 25,000 genes? If every gene is one book, what's going on? So it turns out, as we were explaining in the last lecture, is that these genes can come in variations as well. That's part of that genotype thing we were talking about a little bit earlier too. 25,000 genes can come in variations of them that leads us to a greater variety of proteins, roughly about 150,000 of them. However, if you look at a bacterium on the other hand, much smaller cell, tinier organism, more simplistic if you will, okay, only carries one chromosome, just one, one little circular one, okay, and it's about a tenth of an inch, it's uh, genome. Ours is about six feet, there's about a tenth of an inch, and it carries in it about five million pieces of DNA, five million pieces of uh, nucleotides of DNA, right, yet they carry about 5,000 genes. So the amount of genes is not very kind of parallel between a human and a little E. coli down there, yet they can form roughly the same type of life. Something to live, something to eat, something that reproduces, and so on and so forth. So one of those big messages that we drive here is kind of size does not matter in this case. It's not necessarily the actual size of the cell itself. It's more or less what's present in those genes that actually leads to the effect. So what we want to try and understand here is how do those genes, how is that genome, um, how is that collection of uh, books, if you will, over instructions leads to a human. And so that's where we enter back to our um, central dogma. This is what we call the basis of heredity. How do we pa pass on this information? So back to that central dogma again, 
is this idea of remember, it's the source and order of all genetic information. And so now let's expand upon it. What's the source? Well, that source is, we know it as DNA. Okay, DNA is this collection, okay, of information. It's a blueprint, hence why I usually color it blue. And so that DNA, that collection of genes, that genome itself, provides the instructions to certain products, to certain proteins. So DNA leads to the actual production of very, very specific types of proteins produced. And therefore, proteins are the final product. Now, again, going back to this idea of teaching a little bit outside the class, I'm pretty sure everybody here at some point in time in like Gen Bio or some you know, other class you took, everybody gets taught about Mendel, you know, this little monk that was crossing little uh, plants and flowers and stuff like that and came up with cool versions and discovered genetics, which is true. But unfortunately, it's explained in a very, very simplified manner. When they teach you about genetics, they tell you, ah, well, there's a tall gene and there's a short gene or there's a dark gene, a light gene. There's no such thing. The amount of genes involved in making a plant grow faster or taller or longer involves hundreds of genes. And the same thing applies to tones of color, not even color itself, like shades, if you will. It takes tons and tons of uh, genes to do so. And so when somebody teaches you genetics, they go, oh, well, if you put a tall person, another tall person, you're going to another tall person. That's not really how it works. Overall, it does. But there's no tall gene, nor is there a green gene for, for example, eye color. There's no such thing. What controls color, for example, inside eyes is a collection of about 14 different genes. And the combination of those 14 gives you all these cool shades. Not one. So when you guys did your Punnett squares, for example, those cool little boxes and everybody putting, you know, letter C's and D's and weird stuff like that. No, that's not how it works. But it conveys the message. It teaches you. But here, remember, a human is composed of 25,000 of these. And each one of those 25,000 produce, produces so many versions that it comes up to about 150,000 combinations of each one of those proteins. No, a Punnett square doesn't do its trick. That's not how it works. But overall, the math and the basics works that way. So we want to kind of try and explain to you that this is very, very complex. And so when we look at microbial genetics, okay, when we look at us and compare it to a bacterium or a virus or a protist or something like that, okay, we don't refer them to us, ah, there's the tall gene. There's no such thing. Instead, when we talk about the central dogma, we refer to things as these products and as their instructions. And that those instructions can give us variations as well. So once we get towards the end of this topic and talk about mutation, we'll see it more in depth, right? So what we have is in this case, a building of these nucleotides, those monomers that we talked about in topic B, and that they become a very long chain called a nucleic acid. And so those nucleic acids, there's two of them, uh, the D and the R versions, deoxyribonucleic acid or ribonucleic acid, DNA and RNA, right? And each one of those is a collection of these genes, this collection of these books, like I said, in our library. And ultimately, each one of those genes has different effects depending on how it's being expressed. That topic that we mentioned in the last class called protein expression. So that's what we're going to try and do. So what does it really mean to you? When we're going to learn the central dogma, you, we want you to know that DNA is that blueprint, right? DNA is pretty much a storage of information. DNA is a collection, just like a library. You find a place to hide things, let it sit there, and then access it when you need it. That's what DNA is. It's just holding the instructions when you need them. So we're going to start there. In our central dogma steps, we're going to start with the central dogma and hit off with DNA, the very first step in there. So we want to look at what it's made out of, um, how is it built, and what does it ultimately do, which we kind of already alluded to now. So here we enter what we ta uh, talked about in topic B, and this concept is known as a nucleotide, which com is composed of three main pieces called a base, a sugar, and a phosphate. 
And now we're gonna expand upon it a little bit more because we're gonna look at structure, right? Our sugar, which is normally a ribose, uh, anything that ends with O's usually tells us that it's a sugar, you know, glucose, sucrose, that kind of thing, right? Uh, but this ribose happens to be missing an oxygen on the second carbon. And so it's called a deoxyribose because you remove that oxygen. Now, that makes it a very unique and more uh, stable version of a nucleic acid. And so on that sugar, on this deoxyribose, on the fifth carbon, on carbon five, will attach uh, one of the other pieces, and on carbon one, we'll attach another. So the second piece we attach to it is that phosphate. So I can come up to three of them in a little kind of daisy chain link, right? They're all attached to the carbon five. And so we have up to three phosphates in our nucleic acid. And then we have on the carbon one, we can have a base, a nitrogenous base, because they're usually rich in nitrogen when you look at those structures. And they come in shapes um, of two rings or one single ring, depending on which version exists. And so the two ring versions are known as purines and the one ring version are known as pyrimidines. Now there's two versions of each. There's the adenine and guanine versions of purines and then the cytosine and thymine versions of pyrimidines. There is a third pyrimidine out there but we'll look at that during the DNA, uh, sorry, RNA lecture. Now when we assemble it, it ends up looking like this, right? You have a ribose, a sugar, mixing, uh, missing an oxygen or carbon two, so hence a deoxyribose. On carbon five, we have a phosphate attached on so that little circle. Could be up to three different, uh, uh, three uh, daisy chain versions of those. And then on carbon one, on the top right-hand side, you can have any of those four options, two purines or two pyrimidines. So basically what we're saying is that your nucleotide comes in four flavors. It comes in an A flavor, a G flavor, a T flavor, and a C flavor. That's really what it's doing. And depending on which book you look at, everybody has their own versions of drawing them, but they all conclude the same thing. A sugar, a phosphate, and a, uh, and a base, right? And so for us, we don't really need to know that much detail for it since it's not a biochemistry class, but you should know the overall shape. And so when I draw it, usually I kind of simplified it a little bit. You have your sugar over there in gray or in the center, you have your phosphates attaching those little circles, and then you have your base kind of arranged in a couple of uh, polygons or like a little rectangle off to the side. And that kind of keeps it simplistic for me at least. All right? And it is that new, uh, nitrogenous base that comes in four flavors, that A, G, T, or C currently. And so when you have the phosphates attached, they kind of get renamed into uh, the name plus the word phosphate. So if it has one phosphate, it's called a monophosphate, two of them is called a diphosphate, and then three versions of them has a triphosphate was referred to as a nucleotide triphosphate. So if you have, for example, the A version of this, the adenine version of it, when you have all three phosphates attached, it ends up being called adenosine triphosphate, what you guys know as ATP, for example. That's where those names come into play. Now, thanks to that, though, we're going to start observing how when we arrange them into nucleic acid chains, they gain some really unique superpowers. They get some new flavors, and there's four main uh, properties that you need to know about DNA. And so looking back at those little um, nucleotides that I was drawing earlier, you'll see that I kind of drew them again in the same shapes, three phosphates and four versions or four flavors of that nitrogenous base. So most of the time for simplicity, we just call it the word base. It's very easy to kind of remember that. We get a little lazy if we want to use the word nitrogenous. So we have our bases. Right, four versions of those bases, and then we're going to link them through, as always, uh, dehydration synthesis. And so what happens is that as we link uh, a sugar and a uh, phosphate and a sugar and a phosphate, you end up having this long chain of just sugars and phosphates. But what's unique about it is that as we make those chains, we end up having some really cool properties pop up. And so these are the four that we have listed here. So one, We'll find out that it has a direction, two, that it has different ends, and the other ones kind of as a result of it forming together, it gets to become a double strand and they actually match the bases. So how do we get there, right? So how do we get those four properties? So let's take the ability to make DNA, to make our long chain of a nucleic acid. So we'll take one base, take another base, and we'll link the first one to the second one from the third carbon. 
And so what ends up happening, as we do this enough times, we end up creating this cool little chain in which we remove the phosphates and produce this single phosphate sugar kind of chain. This is called a sugar phosphate backbone. Now what's interesting about this as we make that chain is that we end up with two different ends. If you end up having a long chain of this in the hundreds, thousands, millions, and even billions, on the front end of this, you always have a phosphate just kind of dangling over there. But at the other tail end, you don't. Instead, you only end up having a little uh, hydroxyl group hanging in there. So we actually end up giving them names. On one end, by the five carbon, we end up calling this the five prime phosphate. And at the other tail end, we end up calling that the free three prime hydroxyl. So in other words, we end up labeling our strand of DNA as this kind of direction of five to three. Five prime being on this top end, three prime being on this bottom end. So we refer to that as the polarity of DNA. That DNA has two different ends, two different poles. That's what it's saying. One is a phosphate, one is a uh, hydroxyl group. That's really what it's stating, that our little uh, chain of DNA has two different ends. It's like saying, look at a human. On the top side of it has a head and the bottom side it has feet. So two different ends of the same thing. Now, if we keep on doing this, mind you, is that this long chain of sugars and phosphates, sugars and phosphates, and so forth, so forth. Remember, we have four variations of the bases. And so those bases, those A's, G's, T's, and C's kind of vary based on their composition, those nitrogenous bases we're referring to. And so as we start forming them, we get to find out that interestingly enough, everybody learns first that DNA comes in two strands, but they don't quite explain how. And anytime anybody shows you a picture of DNA, which are all usually doodles, you'll see these cool little helices, this double helix that everybody learns about, but nobody tells you why. I was like, why is there two strands? Why can't it be just one? Well, those answer a little bit more uh, in detail behind it, but it's all about stability and protection. And so we talk about a little bit of the history on how this came about because of the research that occurred um, last century in this case on when people discovered DNA and then suddenly we started figuring out its composition. And this boils down to a uh, scientist named Dr. Shargif who when he analyzed um, DNA, they didn't know what its structure was, found out that when he counted the bases, that the numbers of those bases matched. When he did the math in the thousands and thousands and thousands and even uh, millions of these ultimately, that the A bases and the T bases were pretty damn close. And the same thing happened to the C's and G's but he didn't know why. He couldn't understand why would those numbers match. And the most logical assumption from there is that there had to be two strands. In other words, that there had to be pairs. And lo and behold, he was right, in which when you look at DNA, we find out that the adenines and thymines, the A's and T's, end up being on opposite strands. They're paired up. And they're interacting through hydrogen bonds. And so if that mathematics works that means that we have two strands of dna in which we have what we call base pairs one base is pairing up with the other the bases by themselves are just one bases but when they have the interaction between the two strands we call these base pairs so the adenine and the thymine the a and the t base pair together and then the g and the c base pair together as well so what chargas rules tells us is that DNA happens to be double-stranded, and it happens to tell us that the numbers of A's, G's, T's, and C's match up. And so this is something important for us in microbiology, simply because it tells us how to understand the stability of DNA. Now that we know that the numbers of A's and T's match, and that the numbers of G and C's match, we actually find out that the G and C base pair happens to be a little bit stronger the guanine and cytosine interacting together form three hydrogen bonds, whereas the A and the T only form, form two hydrogen bonds. And so when they're interacting, when they're base pairing, the Gs and the Cs are a little bit stronger than the As and the Ts. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, go back to that whole denaturation thing that we talked about protein. Heat plays a huge role. 
So heat also destroys DNA. It's called melting in this case. Uh, it separates our strands of DNA. So what happens? If you have more G's and C's than you have A's and T's, technically that DNA strand, that double strand, is a little bit stronger. More hydrogen bonds, if you will. Okay. So in microbiology, we actually count those G's and C's. We look at organisms that have a higher amount of GC versus a lower amount of GC. We have a classification based on this called a GC content. And so we'll look at that during the topic F uh, portion of our lectures. So it's important to know those G's and C's. Now, part of your training is being able to understand A pairs up with T and C pairs up with G, and conversely, obviously. But also the fact that you can count the amounts. And so these will be definitely in the test. When we ask you, well, if you know the number of one of them, can you estimate the, the numbers of the others? And again, as long as you can do some basic calculations, that should work, right? So if you know you have 10 A's, you know you always have to have 10 T's. And if you know you have 50 C's, you know automatically you have to have 50 G's. They always match, right? And so if you know the composition of a, of a double strand of DNA, you can estimate the others. And so part of that calculation is fairly straightforward. Let me see if I can do this on our, I'm going to switch this off. In which most of the time we deal with these with percentages. I'm just going to try and do it with blue over here. In which if you have, you know, 100 bases, remember that that means that you have 50 base pairs because they're pairing up, right? And if I tell you some sort of random number of these, and if I tell you that the number of C's happens to be, let's just say, 26, for example, let's make it a little bit more difficult, you should be able to reason what number of G's are present. That would be the idea. And since they pair up based on Dr. Shargaff's rules, you know that that should be 26 as well, right? So logic tells us that one, the numbers match. But we also know that we have 100 bases, and so that means that 52 of these bases happen to be G's and C's. So that means that the remainder of those 100 bases, the other 48, happen to be A's and T's. And since those numbers match, that means we should have 24 of each, 24 A's and 24 T's. Now, since we use the number 100, makes it very, very easy to say, well, that means it's 24% A's, 24% T's, 26% uh, uh, G's, and 26% uh, C's, that kind of thing. So now the math can get a little more complex when we say you have 3 billion of these bases, right? And that's actually what Dr. Shargaff did. He did, was the one that did all this counting. And so we refer to this count as Shargaff's rules. So thanks to Dr. Shargaff, not only do we know the amounts, but we know that they base pair, so they're complementary to each other, so that A's and C's pair up, and that, uh, uh, sorry, A's and T's pair up, and that G's and C's pair up as well, okay? So this is called complementary base pairing. Each base has a matched up version of the other base, A's with T's or T's with A's, whichever version, and C's and G's all together. Now, uh, the question is popping up over here on our chat is, well, what happens when they don't match? Well, technically, that's not supposed to happen, right? That's the whole concept behind the DNA is uh, supposed to be stable. But believe it or not, it does. And so this is what we'll talk about a little bit later in the topic called mutation. Sometimes some of these numbers don't match. And so to kind of clarify what the questions um, is, for example, our 52 G's and C's that we have in there out of the 100 bases leaves us with 48 A's and T's down there too, right? What if the numbers weren't like that? What if we end up with like 53 and 47 or something like that too? Um, the idea is sometimes these don't base pair correctly. And so technically we have some mistakes and that can have some very severe repercussions much later. And we'll talk about mutation towards the end of this topic. So yes, it does happen, although most of the time these are repaired. So we have a really good mechanism to kind of fix those mismatched bases. And this is something known as mismatch repair. Ironically, um, coronaviruses these days do that. 
And so our group of uh, Corona Verde, so I'm being very broad about this, not talking about our disease in particular, um, they have a couple of special proteins that allow them to mismatch repair, to fix those. Some of our drugs, for example, try and create mutations in those viruses and cause them to die, to make mistakes in their proteins. Well, they come with their own fix it mechanism. And so us throwing them in there just allows them to fix themselves faster and create better versions of themselves, ironically. All right. So now, as we continue, the other piece we got to find out is that when these bases pair up, when they're complementary, uh, complement, when the complementarity, sorry, I had to say that correctly, when the complementarity matches A's, T's, G's, C's, right? We came to find out that the direction goes in opposite uh, form. So one of the strands happens to be going one way. The other one, the complementary strand, happens to be going in the complete opposite direction. They're parallel to each other because they're base paired, obviously it's a double strand, but they're going in distinct five to three prime directions in opposite ways. So one strand is going one way, the other strand is going in the exact opposite way in the other direction. So now that's as much as you really need to know about that aside from the fact that, you know, we call that property anti-parallel. Now let's kind of put this all together to create a bigger picture, right? And so we have our two strands over here in the lower right hand corner, right? And we have that sugar phosphate backbone kind of highlighted in these purplish lavenderish colors. And so you'll notice that one strand is going from top to bottom, whereas the other strand is going from bottom to top. That's that anti-parallel direction. You'll notice that there's two strands, so it is double stranded. And you'll notice that those bases, the G's and C's are forming three bonds, the A's and T's are forming two bonds, the hydrogen bonds and the little dots that you're seeing in there. But you'll notice that they're upside down. So anti-parallel direction, complementary to each other. They're base pairing them uh, with each other based on Chargaff's rules. And now the final piece that we actually get to see is that interestingly enough, that when these guys base pair, they start coiling around each other. They have a little bit of a three-dimensional turn. So in the long run, what you end up seeing is that our DNA strands, our double strands, have this really cool helix formation in which this double strand starts kind of bending and curving and ends up having this really neat curvature that what everybody identifies as that uh, double helix that everybody talks about most of the time. Now, anything unique aside from that, aside from structure, not for us. This is kind of where we leave that. Now, we do want to remind you, though, that we have six feet of this stuff. We have two meters of this stuff inside every single one of your 80 trillion cells. And even then, a couple of millimeters inside a bacterium is still a lot of DNA. So we usually need to compact it. We need to make it shorter. Now, most of us, uh, as humans, we have our DNA and we place it in our nucleus. But bacteria, again, they don't have a nucleus. So that's what makes them prokaryotes, right? So they have a little region called a nucleoid region. So I'm gonna write this down on this guy, right? Bacteria have something called a nucleoid region. that does the exact same thing. It's just a little center to store the stuff off to the side. Now, where they hide their DNA, they need to compact it. Again, six feet, seriously. It's taller than most of us. So um, they need to compact it and fill it into this tiny thing that you can barely see under a microscope, even for a bacterium. So our DNA happens to be linear and have some of these very, very long double strand of DNA. And even worst of all, we end up having two copies. Remember, you get one set of copies from parent one and one set of copies from parent two. So that's what we call this, uh, something called diploid, for those who remember your meiosis and mitosis lectures from biology or AMP. But that thing is massive. But interestingly enough, DNA, because of all the phosphates that it has and that sugar phosphate backbone, DNA happens to be very, very negatively charged. So it has an overall strong negative charge to it. And so they invented this really cool version of its complement called a histone. I'm just being facetious here in case you haven't figured that out. A histone happens to be this cool little protein that is extremely positively charged. And so what happens is our cells produce proteins called histones. 
that act as a little scaffold, that act as a place to kind of wind up uh, the long strand of DNA. Now, think about it this way. If you've ever, for example, picked up a cable cord, uh, tied up an extension, or even just some thread around uh, a little spool, you kind of just wind around in circles. Well, that's what a histone does, right? A histone acts like the little spool. And so what you do is take that long chunk of DNA and wind it around that. And so this is a really neat concept. And so we're gonna start at the bottom over here on the right-hand side. And so that's our double strand, our complementary bases, right? Up there, and you'll start seeing the cool little double helix. Now, in these little histones, about a group of six to eight of them, depending on, they kind of bundle up, and your DNA wraps itself around it about two and a half times, believe it or not. So you kind of spool it around there a couple of times. Okay. Now, that'll compact it a little bit, but it doesn't stop there. Once you form your first little spool, your first little um, wind up in there, multiple of those actually form. And so you can take the first set of compacted DNA and then compact it around another compacted one. Yes, you heard me. So you spool a spool around the spool. Still with me? Okay, here it goes again. So when you take the histones and compact your DNA around it two and a half times, you're gonna take multiple sets of those and compact them into something called a chromatin chain. Now that's not enough for six feet. So you take the chromatin chain and compact it into more compaction. So you take the spool around the spool around the spool. And that's a structure called a nucleosome. Now you take that and you take that spool around the spool around the spool and spool, spool it around itself. So you compact the compaction two more times and a structure called a supercoil. And so once you have it supercoiled, you supercoil it again. So you take your DNA and wind it up and wind up the wind up, then wind up the wind up of the wind up, then wind up the wind up of the wind up of the wind up. Yes, I'm still counting. And then you wind up the wind up of the wind up of the wind up one more time. And then you wind it up again. You guys know that as a chromosome. DNA, when it, most of the time it's not kind of gooishly floating around, it can be super compacted into what we call a chromosome. Now what's interesting about this though, is that our chromosome only exists in this format when it's about to divide. So what most of you guys have been seeing for a good chunk of time has been a little bit of a lie. Most of our DNA kind of exists off to the side, kind of in this very kind of um, gooish kind of blobbish format, then it only forms into these shapes of chromosomes. For example, when the cell is about to divide, it super compacts itself into what you guys have seen in pretty much every pretty picture and every silly movie out there in which we call it a chromosome. As a matter of fact, that cool little X shape that you see only exists when the cell has duplicated its DNA. Otherwise, it's not arranged that way. So it is unfortunate that most people are taught this information and this is the kind of the way that you know, people get um, envision what DNA actually looks like. And so when the cell is about to divide, it duplicates its amount of DNA and ends up looking like that cool little X that chromosomes talk about. In reality, it's only about half of that one side of that X that you're seeing up there. And so that, those little blobs that you're seeing there are these wines of wines of wines of wines that end up giving you this compacted form known as a chromosome. So when you take six feet worth of this stuff and divide it into 23 chromosomes, that's what you actually end up seeing. Okay. So now our E. coli can do the same thing, just in the small, slightly smaller version. So bacteria do the same concept. They don't just quite look like that though. Now, out of all our DNA though, most of that DNA is being used to uh, create your proteins. But believe it or not, sometimes there's extra DNA floating around there that does not do what we think it does. Okay? It's not really creating the proteins that we need to serve life. Some organisms out there, especially the ones we're interested in microbiology, um, have this what we call extra nuclear DNA. About 5% of it, about a 20th of this, is DNA um, that is used to do other things for the cell. 
for example, some of it can be present inside our mitochondria and chloroplasts to do something else, in this case, to power up mitochondria and stuff like that. But some of it is known as what we call plasmids. Humans don't have that, mammals don't have that. But shrooms have them, protists have them, and definitely our bacteria have them. And what's really neat about these is that those plasmids, for example, give bacteria superpowers. So we'll talk about that a little bit later too. Now, remember, bacteria, archaea also are tiny organisms. So they don't carry six feet of DNA and their volume is smaller too. So they pack up their material in this nucleoid region that I was talking about earlier. And they also compact it using proteins that are called histone-like proteins. So they don't not called just histones, they're called histone-like. And they're abbreviated in a name called WHO proteins. And that's after Dr. WHO, believe it or not, who actually named that little piece. Okay. Now the other neat thing about uh, prokaryotes is that their DNA is circular. They don't have a beginning or an end. So theirs kind of loops around and then kind of closes off. And very opposite to us, remember we carry two copies. Humans carry one from mom, one from dad kind of thing. Prokaryotes only carry one copy, so they're considered to be haploid organisms as opposed to diploid organisms like we are. We have lots of chromosomes. They only usually have one. So a little more simplistic version of life. Okay. Now let's go back to those plasmids, right? Um, that extra nuclear DNA, and I'm going to spend some time talking about it this in multiple lectures. This is one of the most unique features of microorganisms, a really neat one, one of my favorite parts of the uh, subject is something called a plasmid. Plasmids happen to be their own little chunks of DNA. They're doing their own thing. They replicate on their own and they do their own thing on themselves. Now, mind you, this extra DNA is non-essential. They don't, they're not needed for survival, okay? They don't contribute anything specific for the cell to, step to remain alive, but they always provide an advantage. In other words, they provide a superpower. Now, there's various versions out there. There's up to six different ones that most people are familiar with, but there's four that I'm kind of going to discuss with you guys. And they're usually uh, abbreviated by what they kind of do or their title. And so these are known as F plasmids, R plasmids, B plasmids, and V plasmids. And so, for example, the F plasmids, which, which stand for fertility in this case, it means exactly what you're actually assuming. Bacteria, remember, as you all probably learned a long time ago, divide on their own. They're asexual. Most people know that. And the idea here is that one cell divides into two, two into four, just by kind of splitting itself. Well, that's not entirely true. Bacteria that have F plasmids kind of play into what something we call bacterial sex. Now, that's the kind of colloquial term that we use. In reality, this is known as conjugation. That's the official term in which bacteria that have an F plasmid can actually interact with other bacteria, either very closely related or identical to them, and pass on genes. They swap, they trade plasmids. And what's ironic about this is that they form a, what's an equivalent to this little exchange tube. You'll hear it most of the time, you'll hear it from the term also. This is called a pilus. And so, F plasmids allow the production of a structure called the pilus. Yes, it sounds like penis. That's where that's come, coming from. Okay. Um, and so they extend this little tube, connect to the other cell, and swap DNA. It's the coolest thing ever. They trade genetic information. What could it be so dangerous about that? Well, look at the other three for a second. R plasmids, for example, they have the ability to confer antibiotic resistance, meaning that the organism can look at your drug and spit it out back at you and laugh at you. We'll talk about the details later, mind you. Our plasmids provide resistance. It basically makes these organisms stronger against us trying to treat the disease. B plasmids, on the other hand, produce this little uh, substance called bacteriocin, which happens to be kind of like a little mini gun. And they end up shooting at each other and killing their competition. They fight each other. They kill off whatever they don't like. So they destroy the competition. And probably one of the more infamous of them all is the virulence plasmids. 
the one that usually gives them some sort of power to harm the host, in this case, us. Now, I want you to understand what those three last ones are and what happens when you combine them with the top one. What if an organism has multiple plasmids and starts trading these? If you're of the generations before me or with me um, and ever played anything from card games to pogs to Pokemon to whatever and trading cards kind of concept, think about it that way. Swapping off information to gain some sort of ability. If an F plasmid transfers a resistance plasmid, now that new organism has the ability to resist antibiotics. If that F plasmid transfers a B plasmid, now that organism acquires the ability to kill off its competition. And probably far worse than anything else, if an F plasmid transfers a V plasmid, that organism that probably was innocuous to you and didn't harm you ever, now has the ability to kill you. They're trading superpowers, advantages. That's where these plasmids come into play. They're extremely dangerous. So organisms that are mixing together could be possibly trading information. And that's where the plasmids become dangerous. And we'll talk about this also under the immunity and how to protect ourselves and under bacterial control as well. So we'll get to those. But these are the extra little things that bacteria and fungi um, and certain protists carry. We don't do that. Now, um, yes, to answer the question is mo uh, these plasmids can be transferred multiple times and more than one amount. That's where the craziness becomes. All right, so all this long story on how to build DNA, well, what does it do? Well, we already told you, it's a repository, right? It's a uh, storage of information and that's where we hold our blueprints. Now, in humans, again, that's about 25,000 genes or so, and it codes for about 150,000 different proteins. But even in like a bacterium, that's about a 5,000 gene collection. As we will see a little bit later um, in topic F2, you'll see that, for example, a virus can carry only three of them. That's how simplistic they get. Three genes. That's it. Not a thousand, not a hundred, not dozens, three. And with those three, it can take you out. So don't forget that. We'll talk about that fun stuff in the virus lecture. Right? And so as we're going to see what this is, that it's important to keep all our genes. It's important to keep all our DNA intact. And as we're going to see at the end of this topic, what happens when you miss them? What happens when you make mistakes? What happens when you end up deleting these by accident, if you will? Anytime you miss a gene, that means those cells are not going to function, and this can typically lead to cell death. Typically, some sort of malfunction is initial, but most of the time those cells die because they're unable to do their jobs. Right? Common example that I can give you, your red blood cells. Remember that they only last about three to four months at best, and that's because they lose their nucleus. They lose their DNA. They actually shed out their DNA, so they no longer have the ability to produce new stuff. So your blood cells actually have a finite lifetime. So let's take that picture that we started with originally, right? Every cell, eukaryotic or prokaryotic, has this collection of information inside of it, typically in some sort of nucleus-like uh, structure, right? And so inside of it, that DNA, those many, many feet, many, many, uh, Millimeters, if you will, sometimes are compacted into chromosomes. But ultimately, that collection of stuff, right, will be translated into what we call proteins. And those are going to be the functional pieces of everything we're going to make. Okay? So, how do we make more? And so, we enter our very first step in the central dogma. How to make more DNA. So the process of replication, our very first step in the central dogma, let's just make more of it. Now, when you learn this in good old gen bio or possibly a &P, you learn this concept of mitosis that everybody talks about and you learn all the cool steps, right? In which you take one parent cell that divides into two daughter cells, right? And those two daughter cells divide into two, uh, four more and so on and so forth. That was pretty much the basics. However, for us, 
we're interested in the genetics more than anything else because we're going to be talking about bacteria more than anything else too. So we're still going to take our parent DNA and we're going to divide it into two pieces. But what happens for us is that in order to copy new strands of DNA, we have to use the old strands. We use them as templates. And so what happens is we use the old version of it to make a new version attached to it. And so this process is known as semi-conservative replication. And I'm going to show you more or less how that works in a couple of steps. Now, what I'm going to show you this is how we normally teach this subject in our class. I always will give you a slide that kind of gives you the overall idea of what's happening. The slide shows you not only what it does, what's involved specifically, what are the key players, more or less, and what are the basic steps for it to happen. Every single one of our central dogma steps is going to have this too. It's going to look exactly like this guy. And then we're going to show you how it actually works with some sort of pretty picture. Now here, uh, what you're seeing on the top left hand side is our double strand of DNA, right? Remember that our double strand of DNA is around histones, kind of compacted around compaction, around compaction, around compaction. So that one of the first things that typically needs to happen is that it needs to be decompacted, if you will, or unwound. Because remember, it's kind of tied in and tied in and tied in. So there are proteins called gyrases and topoisomerases that do that. They kind of unwind the DNA strand. Now, in order to copy our DNA strand, we need to actually separate the two strands from each other too. This is known as DNA melting, okay, that's separation of the two strands. And so for that, there's a cool little protein called DNA helicase. And so its name comes from the fact that it's opening up the helix. And so often this is referred to as unzipping because it kind of looks like a little zipper. And so unzipping the DNA or DNA melting is pretty much the separation of the two strands. Now it has to have a place to begin this. It has to know where to start. You don't unwind all your six feet of DNA. You only unwind the part that you're gonna use. In other words, you don't take the entire library home. You only take the one book that you want to use, right? So helicase has to find a um, part to kind of start this too. And so you pick the place to begin, and that place has a fun, uh, fancy little name called the origin of replication. So you usually get it abbreviated OR or OOR, depending on who um, uh, states it. And so it'll begin splitting the two strands into what we call the replication fork, and then enter the key protein that everybody should know, a DNA polymerase. The name derives from something you will be guaranteed testing. It makes polymers. What type of polymers? DNA ones, hence the name DNA polymerase. And so the DNA polymerase does is as it reads the open DNA, the old strand that is there, it'll start building brand new ones in a five prime to three prime direction, reminding you that our DNA strands are anti-parallel, okay? So let's show it to you in a more visually appealing version of this. Uh, one that does not come from your book in this case. And so here you have the same thing, just kind of seen from right to left instead. You have your double strand in there, your cool little double helix. You have your helicase in there kind of melting the strands. And then you see the polymerases, both creating brand new strands in this lighter blue color around the actual two old strands. And so what ends up happening, what you see on the lower right-hand side, is that as you split up or as you unzip the DNA, as you melt the DNA, new strands are built inside of it. And so that creates two new strands out of the two old strands. So now let's kind of put this into a little bit more simplistic version of drawing this. And then let's add the speed to this concept, right? So I want you to understand and remind you that, for example, that for humans, when humans come with this, we're coming with about six feet of this stuff, three billion bases in this linear DNA. And so our uh, enzymes will usually kind of separate these guys out into two separate strands, that concept known as melting or unzipping. And it will produce from those two strands in a five to three prime direction, remember that these are anti-parallel, two new strands from it. Again, always five to three, so that means this guy's gonna be produced new five to three, 
and the other guy is going to be producing you five to three also with some minor changes in there that one of them is built in little chunks but we don't need to know that and i'll do that and that's how they'll stay what will happen is that these two old and new versions this guy will go up and turn into one cell and this guy will go into another cell so what ends up happening is the daughter cells the new organisms that you produce end up having one strand of DNA that is the old one and they end up also containing one strand of DNA that is the new one so that name of that type of replication is called semi-conservative replication because it's not keeping the same two old strands together and the same new strands together. Now, reminding you is that, again, this needs to take six feet of DNA, three billion bases. And some of you guys need to probably look at this number in a more visual version because I like doing that, so it's actually kind of fun. So I want you to understand, three billion of these, okay? That's lots of zeros, okay? And so your DNA polymerase, I want you to understand this, builds DNA at roughly a speed of about a thousand nucleotides per second. Okay. So for those of you who haven't figured that out, okay, just do the math really quick. It shouldn't be too bad. It should take, if it does a thousand nucleotides per second, it should take 3 million seconds. Okay. How much is 3 million seconds? Anybody? Anybody thought about this? Okay, if you're not doing that math really quick, it should be 50,000 minutes. Okay, and if you haven't thought about how long uh, 50,000 minutes is about 833 hours. Still not with me over here? That's over a month worth of doing this. I should understand how long that takes. Right? That's, it would take it a month to replicate those six feet of DNA. Luckily, believe it or not, it does it in multiple sets, not just in one. So what do I mean by that is that there's multiple origins of replication. In other words, it starts instead of one piece, lots of pieces altogether. But think about this, a thousand bases per second this will make a mistake and it actually does it makes a mistake roughly every 100,000 every year so that's man that's this guy over here every 100,000 bases that it places it screws up and makes a mistake so what does that mean well if you have 3 billion of these again do the zeros thing right you can do the zeros so we have nine zeros, okay? And you're gonna make a mistake every other five zeros. You see how this kind of cancels out with each other? So here, let me get, make it a little bit more visually appearing, appealing, sorry. If you can make a mistake every five zeros here, okay? We're gonna make mistakes every five of these. So if you haven't seen this, that's 30,000 mistakes every single time it replicates. Most of the time, one mistake is lethal. So how do we survive with a polymerase, a building of new DNA that screws up 30,000 times per division? Well, let this be a lesson to all you students. This is why spell check exists. Before you submit your papers, always review your work. Well, believe it or not, our DNA polymerases review their work. They proofread. And when they proofread, all out of those 30,000 mistakes, they might leave one. So that is called a backup. That's absolutely right. So when it kind of proofreads itself, it only ends up making a mistake roughly every 10 billion. So it might make a mistake every three cell divisions, not even one division, every other other division or so. So that's a very, very important factor here for us, okay?
it does spell check. Otherwise, we'd all be just dying most of the time. Now let's compare this across the board between our eukaryotes and our prokaryotes, right? So remember, this is kind of like us, our little humans, right? And this could be our E. coli over here. Remember, E. coli is much smaller, right? Tinier, less genes, that kind of thing. We all have to make more DNA regardless of what organism you have. But our DNA happens to be linear. And I already told you, for example, that uh, prokaryotes have a circular type of DNA. And so when we replicate, our DNA goes in both directions from that origin of replication. It goes both ways. But in a circle, that's kind of different. So it enters a stage called theta replication. I'm going to show you that. It's kind of neat. But also the size matters. There's so much DNA that we carry that, again, taking us over a month to replicate one piece of DNA in our cells is way too much. So you find multiple, multiple places to start. Create multiple origins of replication, lots of them. Bacteria, on the other hand, prokaryotes only usually have one. We also use lots of different polymerases to help us with the process. Bacteria just do it themselves on with one protein. The other big thing, for example, is that we all modify our DNA. After we're done replicating it, for example, uh, organisms like uh, plants and mushrooms the C's and the A's, G's, T's, and C's gets modded. They get tagged, basically. So for example, on the letter C on your bases, they get a little tag attached to it. And that tag allows it to be identified as itself so that it can recognize foreign DNA, for example, and destroy it. Prokaryotes do something similar, but typically they do it to their A's. So they take the little A bases and they put a little tag onto it too. So we're going to start seeing that even though most organisms have the same processes, there are some tiny little differences in there. So let's give, give you the probably the most entertaining of the differences is that it's circular DNA. And so when it replicates, it has to do this weird little peeling mechanism of the two new strands kind of as they're created, start creating this weird little shape called a theta letter. So like the Greek letter theta, that's where it, it kind of pops up, right? Um, and then it peels off into two little wheels. So just kind of on a little quick comparison, us versus them, right? So we have linear DNA, they have circular DNA, for example. And so during our semi-conservative replication, our linear DNA just kind of gets split into two and we can create two different cells, whereas theirs, it undergoes this cool little theta replication version, and then it separates out into two new uh, sets of DNA itself. So that's kind of that story behind that. All right. So let's hold it together over here and see where we can go with some new questions. Okay. okay so now that we have our DNA piece uh, out of the way, we're going to do very similar types of explanation with, with RNA. Now, since we have the background in DNA, the RNA portion becomes much easier because a lot of it is extremely similar. So knowing one helps you understand the other much faster. So if you have a little bit of trouble, always review the DNA one first, right? So if we enter step two in the central dogma or part two, the second component of the central dogma, we cover DNA and replicated it, replicated it so we made more. But now we want to decode it. We want to make sense out of it. We want to make it useful. We want to build something out of it. And so that's the process known as transcription, when we decode the blueprint of DNA and turn it into something we can more or less understand. That's the RNA portion. And so RNA technically, and the more importantly version of it, mRNA or messenger RNA, is the decoder. The easiest way I usually explain this uh, is for everybody is that blueprints exist. And yes, there are instructions to build things, but most people don't know how to read a blueprint. So short of you being a contractor or an architect, most of that stuff is not easy to read. And the same thing may apply to a textbook. Sure, a textbook is available for you to read, but if you don't really have the understanding behind it, kind of hard to understand anyway. So 
you always need like an interpreter, somebody that will help you understand it better, somebody that will put it in your terms. That's what RNA is. It, declo it decodes sorry, the blueprint itself, and it makes more sense for it to be understood that way. That's really what RNA is. It's the middle step of all of this. And so we're going to create RNA from DNA as a template through a process known as transcription. And it's going to utilize a protein very similarly named called RNA polymerase. The previous step involved DNA polymerases. Here it involves RNA polymerases. So to convert or to actually transcribe RNA, uh, we need our RNA polymerase and a template. But RNA actually comes in three flavors. For those of you who remember topic B, we talked about RNA coming in three different functions, mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA, which stand for messenger, transfer, and ribosomal RNA. And each one of those has a different job. The one we're going to focus on right now is the M1, the messenger RNA. The other two come a little bit later when we start making proteins. So hold on to those two. So when we look at RNA, RNA already has the exact same structure of DNA. It's still the bases, still the sugar, and still some phosphates. However, the bases change in which we no longer have base T. Instead, it gets replaced by a base called uracil, or base U. Aside from that, instead of being A's, G's, T's, and C's, it's now A's, G's, T, uh, C's, and U's. Sorry. Now, the sugar, on the other hand, does come with that missing oxygen attached to that second carbon. So it's present now. So it's no longer a deoxy version. It's just a ribose by itself. And then the phosphates are still the same. So when we look at these guys, they don't really look that different. You have DNA on the left-hand side or a nucleotide on the left side, and you have a ribose, uh, an RNA nucleotide on the right-hand side or with a the ribose. They don't really look that different. As a matter of fact, the structure of both of these is very, very similar. Smallest differences, like I said, one of the key ones is obviously one uses thymine versus using uracil for RNA. So this is our RNA version, whereas this was our old DNA version that we just finished looking at, right? And that that sugar, that ribose versus deoxyribose version. Our deoxy version, missing that oxygen there, so there's no O, whereas it is present here. So yes, O. Those are the key differences. That's it. Structural wise, you're done. We spent you know, a good 10, 15 minutes talking about this DNA, RNA, you already know it. Those are the two big differences. Now, how are you gonna make more? So we need to be able to decode that DNA and convert it into RNA. So this is something known as gene expression. You're gonna hear this term every now and then, especially when you start reading cool little articles. That means we're gonna turn our DNA and start using it. Not just copying it, but using it now, okay? So here's that slide that I promised you earlier. There's always gonna be an overall slide. The process of transcription is converting DNA into a more legible RNA, the players that are involved, the process, and where it starts and where it ends. Now again, this all gets simplified into uh, one sim uh, more basic picture, right? And so transcription, in this case, will take our double strand of DNA, melt it also, and now using a protein called RNA polymerase, it'll start making its own little strand of RNA, which you'll notice here appears in red. But it needs to know where to start and where to end. So the beginning and ending points get a fancy little name called promoter to begin it and terminator to end it. So it knows exactly where to start and it knows exactly where to end. And that's it. It's the same process. RNA polymerase comes in, melts the DNA, or separates it as out, or breaks it or unwinds it, and then starts making its own strand of DNA. But what you will definitely notice is that it only makes one strand of RNA. It makes a single strand of RNA based on the template. That's it, okay? Now, I did mention there's other couples of versions of RNA out there. So we'll come and talk about tRNA and rRNA, which are still the RNA though, um, and they're used for um, making protein. So hold on to that thought, like I said. So that's it. Those are the big deals between RNA transcription 
as well as its structure. That's it. We had to cover it in just a matter of minutes. However, we still need to pay attention to what happens after. And so these are the differences that exist between us, for example, eukaryotes versus prokaryotes. One of the main things that occurs in us that does not occur in uh, prokaryotes, so that means not in prokaryotes, that means does not occur in bacteria or archaea, is that we modify our RNA. We tweak it. They don't. They just use their RNA and use it immediately. We actually mess with our RNA after we're done making it. And so this is called post-transcriptional modification or after transcription, we modify it. So here's one of the versions that I'm gonna show you. After we've uh, produced our RNA, we will process it. That's the term that we use. And so the easiest way to kind of show this to you is we do three main things. One of the first things we do to our RNA that you're seeing up there is that we like to put a little hat onto it. This is called capping. And so at the top of our RNA or at the beginning of our RNA, we like to add a little G in reverse, just right at the beginning. One inverted G. That's it. That's all we do. And so that cap, that little hat that we're applying to it, is designed to kind of protect it from the front end, to prevent it from being broken down. It helps with its stability. Helps it last a little bit longer. How about that? That's the capping portion. Now on the other end, we also mess with it too. At the tail end, at the three prime end, we end up adding a boatload of A's. So this is referred to as polyadenylation. So adding a bunch of A's at the tail end. And as you can see, it can be anywhere between 100 to 200 to 300 A's all at the tail end. In other words, on one portion of our RNA, we put a little cap, and at the other end, we put a little tail that just screams, ah, like nothing, just a bunch of A's all together over there, right? And those are two main modifications. We protect our RNA from both ends. That's really what it's doing. Now, those two modifications actually help it later uh, with the third process that is more important than anything else. This is called splicing. The third and final step of modification has to do with us trimming our RNA. And so this is where it gets kind of interesting because uh, the term splicing is specifically focusing on this. The problem is most people use the term splicing as some sort of secret evil scientist messing with DNA or something like that. And in reality, that's not what it is. Okay, splicing pretty much means um, cutting or editing, if you will, um, pieces of our RNA that we want to use, okay? So in our RNA, the sequence of our RNA, we have pieces that are useful and pieces that are not at times. And so these are referred to as introns and exons, okay? And so introns are the pieces that we don't use. That doesn't mean they're useless, they're actually quite useful, believe it or not. But those are the pieces we're not going to use. Okay, And then the exons are the ones we are. And so what splicing does is it takes the introns and cuts them out, splices them out basically, and then keeps the exons and pieces them together. It unites them. That's called RNA splicing. And that's the final modification. Now, why is this an important concept for us? Now, for those of you who remember the story, remember that humans start off with about 25,000 genes, which means that we can produce 25,000 different RNAs. But don't forget that we produce about 150,000 proteins. So how do we make 25,000 give us 150,000? 
So what we do is we splice them. We basically cherry pick the sequences that we want and the ones we don't. And we can build different pieces out of them. So to kind of re-explain all of this, that way it can come together, the RNA that we produce gets modified. We get a little hat and we get a little tail. That's fine. But that little hat and tail help with this process too, in which we splice our RNA, we choose pieces that we want so that we can make proteins later. Splicing means cutting or editing. And what we cut or edit are sequences called exons. Exons are the pieces we want to use. The ones we don't use are called introns. So introns are the ones we don't use, exons are the ones we do use. And so what you're seeing here is, for example, sometimes we can splice our RNA and cherry pick what we want. So for version one, our RNA will produce, uh, will splice, sorry, part one, two, four, five, and six. So it's taking one, two, four, five, and six. But you can splice it differently. Sometimes you can only take a few of them. You take one, three, five, and six. You spliced out two and four, for example. So introns are the ones we don't use. Exons are the ones we do use. And ultimately, we create variations of this RNA. So this is really where this key feature comes into play. The only reason why we get 150,000 different proteins is because of splicing. Well, not the only reason, but this is one of the major reasons, is that we can create variations of what we have. Think about it as a collection of parts, and then you can build whatever you want out of it. We give you six different pieces, and then out of those six, you can choose five of them, three of them, four of them, doesn't matter, and build something out of it. That's what splicing does. It gives us options. Okay? That's what its plan does. Okay? So... That's the piece that we call post-transcriptional modification. So after transcription, we mess with things. We tweak it a little bit more. So again, reminding you that post-transcriptional modification only occurs in eukaryotes. Bacteria doesn't do this. Okay, archaea don't do this. Humans do this. Dogs do this. Not E. coli. So now, now that we've prepared our second step in the central dogma, we're going to look at our last step. So, so far, we've known how to make more DNA, replication. We've known how to decode the DNA into RNA, that's transcription. And now we're going to use that RNA to build something out of it, that's translation. Okay. So, translation, the idea is to take all those ribosomes that we learned in topic C, the workers in our factory, for those of you who remember that, and build useful things for the cell, build things to keep it alive. So now this process is very energy intensive. This is where most of the energy that you consume goes into, believe it or not, is to build proteins. So this uses a very unique version of proteins called GTP, not ATP like most people learn about. So process again, overall picture, what is it does? Uh, what does it do, sorry? What are the players? Where does it start, where does it end? And how does it go through? So for that though, I wanna kind of reemphasize what we talked about in topic C, that ribosome. Here is this very unique machinery that builds protein and it consists of two pieces, a large subunit and a small subunit, which is what you're seeing there in this uh, three-dimensional kind of graphic representation of what a ribosome looks like. Now this ribosome is unique because it no longer looks at DNA or RNA, RNA specifically, as bases. It looks at them in groups of three bases at a time. And this is something known as a codon. So translation, rather than occurring in A's, G's, C's, and U's, it looks at them in groups of three of them. And so each group of three is referred to as a codon. And each codon represents one possible combination. So now remember that we come with 
four bases, A's, G's, C's, and U's, right? And our codon has three spaces, three different options. So if any of these could be an A, G, C, and a U at any stage, if you do the math really quick, you'll notice that there's four possibilities here, four possibilities here, and four possibilities here, which means that you have a total or a grand total of 64 possible combinations. In other words, 64 different possible codons. But to remind you what we saw at the beginning of today is that we only have 20 amino acids. So why do we need 64 different combinations? So now let's show you visually what that uh, combination of codons looks like. So those three letters, these are normally used as what we call them codon wheels as a way to kind of simplify how to read them. And so you can read them from the center towards the outside and just kind of follow the pattern. For example, the very, very first amino acid that appears on most proteins starts with the code A, U, and G. The, code, the codon AUG represents the amino acid methionine. Now, however, if you switch it off to AUU, for example, you get amino acid isoleucine. So it's that three-letter code that gives us which amino acid we're going to use to build our proteins. But remember, there's only 20 amino acids, yet there's 64 codes. The reason why those 64 codes exist is because of something called redundancy. And for the colloquial terms, we also call this a wobble effect. The idea behind this is that it's nice to have backups. Sometimes during replication, during transcription, and definitely during translation, sometimes we don't quite read these correctly. Remember the whole spell checking concept? What if we don't replicate correctly? We don't put the right base. What if we don't read it? What if we don't spell check it? In other words, what if we make a mistake? Well, let's look at, for example, uh, the amino acid next to it just briefly, let me focus on this color. Let's just play with an amino acid that starts with a C, second one is a G, and then the third one is a G. Well, that gives you amino acid arginine. But what if you screw up and accidentally not put a G and you put an A instead? Well, you still get arginine. But if you screw that one up and put a C instead, you get the picture. This is called a wobble effect. That last base gives you a little bit of wiggle room, if you will. So there's this redundant or backup system that allows us to always put the right amino acid instead of putting the wrong one. It is a safety net, if you will. That's where the term redundancy exists. Okay. Now, just to kind of see how this works, this is typically explained a little bit more uh, efficiently using a visual representation, but here's the overall slide again. And what you have, what it does, where it does, where does it start, where does it end, and what is involved. Now, instead of doing that, allow me to show you the ribosome first. Remember, the ribosome is the machinery. That's our worker in our factory. That's the one that builds stuff in our factory. So our ribosome consists of two pieces, a large one and a small one, which is what you're seeing there, right? And inside of it, there's three particular little holes or pockets, if you will. And so these are known as the E, P, and A sites. I'll talk about them in a second, so hang on. Now, each of these three pockets has a, a purpose. One of them is designed to allow amino acids to come in with RNA. So there's an entry point. This is called an E site. And then one of them is where it leaves the, uh, gets rid of the, the actual tRNAs later. Okay. I'm so sorry, I got these backwards. I apologize. Let me kind of reset that for half a second. That's not called the E site. Let me correct this. This is called an A site. 
I'm being silly. So please take the time to correct that. Let's not re-record this whole thing. So that's an A site for accepting. I screw that up because the other one that leaves is called the E site, which is the exit. That's what I was messing up. Sorry about that part. So there's an entry point and an exit point. So one goes in, one goes out. And then there's the part where things happen. So this is the P site. This is where we make polymers. So this is what you know as the polymerizer site. So why is this important? Well, for this to understand the process that we just described here, okay, they're written up here too, just in case you're wondering. Okay, in order for a ribosome to build a protein, it's going to need to read its RNA that it got from DNA. So kind of a quick summary. Remember you had your cool little chunk of DNA, right? And then you transcribed it into smaller pieces of RNA. Those are your genes, right? And now you're gonna take one of those and turn it into a protein. The issue here is that the first two steps you just learned just use nucleotides. They use the A's, G's, T's, and C's. But the third one uses something different. It uses amino acids. So how do we go from that one to that one? How do we switch off components? Well, here's where that handy RNA piece that I was talking about earlier comes into play. There's this little thing called a transfer RNA or tRNA, which literally, as its name implies, that transfer part. Transfer RNA actually carries amino acids. It transfers them, transfers them, sorry. And so in our next picture that we were showing you earlier, that's what you're seeing floating around in those little disks. These are tRNAs with the little amino acid attached to it. And so transfer RNAs carry the amino acids, bring them in into the acceptor site, build them at the polymerizer site, and once they're empty, they exit at the E site. So let's show it to you a little bit differently. Now kind of showing you the interaction between the tRNA and the ribosome and the RNA inside of it. You'll see your little tRNA over here in the little light blue. You'll see that it's carrying an amino acid, right? And so in the P site that we're seeing over here, it's actually gonna take this one and it's gonna link it to another one. It's gonna polymerize it, it's gonna make it a chain. And so a new one comes in, in the acceptor site, and then the old one leaves at the exit site. So let's show this to you visually again, just in a smaller picture. In the center is your polymerizer site. You'll see that a new tRNA over here, plus an amino acid, see this guy over here, is going in. And once it enters, over here in step two, you'll notice that it fuses them together, polymerizes it. It puts them together, it links them. And so then you'll notice that our chain on step three over here is now attached to this guy. And this guy is now empty. So then what happens is that our ribosome We'll move one space over, one codon over, and then that means that the other guy falls out, and then the new one goes to the middle. And then you repeat the cycle again, growing the chain every single time. So a new one comes in, builds, creates a new polymer chain so it gets the chain longer, 
then it moves, kicks out the old one, and then repeats again. That's the cycle. And so this process of building in one amino acid at a time, kind of looked at it in a smaller version of that sequence, right? It moves across the RNA, little by little building a polypeptide chain. This whole process is what you learn as translation. It's building a chain of amino acids or a polypeptide chain. Okay. So let's kind of put this all together really fast in the simpl most simplistic slide you can ever see. We looked at three processes, three different components. We looked at DNA, RNA, and protein, and we looked at their processes, replication, transcription, translation. We told you what they're used for. One to make more, one to decode, one to build. Make more, decode, build. And then we told you where does it start and where does it end. And so for, trans uh, for replication, I'm sorry, there was these things called origins of replication. For transcription, you had promoters and terminators. For translation, on the other hand, okay, we have what we call start and stop codons, beginning and end of those three letter codes. Okay. That's that case over there. So, Putting that whole picture together, we're gonna to look at proteins in a moment in more detail. So before I begin, let's make sure we answer some questions. Okay, so we've covered DNA, we've covered RNA, we've covered protein, we've covered our replication, transcription, and translation. However, after we make protein, it doesn't really end there. Proteins, just because they're made, are not quite ready to use, okay? So believe it or not, in for example, humans, this is just a human example, although it's similar in other organisms, about 75% of the proteins we make are what we call constitutive, meaning we're always using them. They're active, we're using them as they're being made. However, about a quarter of them or so is what we call facultative, in which we only produce them when we need them. And the reason behind this is kind of useful to kind of save on energy and materials. If you don't need to make something, why waste it? That's really what it's doing. And so the control that exists between building them or not building them, or building them as needed, is called regulation. And we're gonna have an entire topic on this after we look at metabolism. So this concept of protein expression is a much bigger topic. Okay, so we'll get there once we get into metabolism and stuff. So turning proteins on, meaning making them, uh, building them, I'm sorry, not turning them on itself, is called induction. And then putting them away and saying not making more of them is called repression. In other words, we induce proteins when we need them and we repress them when we don't. Sounds very political, unfortunately. But the idea here is, for example, you're not eating food all the time. So technically, well, maybe you're like me and you are eating food all the time, but uh, you only produce certain digestive enzymes when you consume food. You don't need to really produce them when you're not really consuming anything. So at certain times, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner kind of thing, you can induce certain proteins to help you digest your food. And then after you're done processing them, you can repress them and get rid of them. So this is called protein regulation and protein control more than anything else. So again, we'll get into far more details of this during metabolism. But the idea is as follows. In a uh, eukaryotic cell that has a nucleus, remember your DNA is hiding in there, and then you'll make your, or, uh, your RNAs uh, out of RNA polymerase, and transcription, and then those pieces of RNA can be made into proteins through your uh, ribosomes, your little workers inside your cells, right? But those proteins, after they pass through the uh, rough ER, can get activated at the Golgi apparatus. Remember, they get 
you know, tagged and set to do their jobs and that kind of thing. And then they'll start doing their thing. Then they'll start doing their jobs. But that's pretty much very straightforward. DNA, RNA, protein, and that's about it. We turn on 75% of them most of the time and about a quarter of them, and we use them as needed. Bacteria, on the other hand, prokaryotes, on the other hand, are very different. Bacteria, first of all, smaller. They live uh, shorter lifespans, and so they need to be a little bit more efficient on how they actually produce their proteins. They produce their proteins in packages. This is called an operon. Okay, so for those of you who are a little old like me, um, will remember a time before digital music, and we actually had to wait for a radio to play the song that we wanted to hear and hit a record button and trap the song, hopefully that they weren't speaking through. And we saved this information in something called a cassette. Now, these cassettes, which still exist, mind you, by the way, I'm not that old, is, is a collection of music all that you can play it technically in one shot. That's what an operon is. Operons actually used to be called cassettes and that uh, we gave them a fancier name. An operon is basically a bunch of genes that are all produced at the same time. Now the idea behind it is very simple. Efficiency. It saves you time and it saves you energy to produce things all at the same time. That's what an operon is all about. Okay, now the reason why it has the name operon is because we introduce a brand new sequence called an operator that we haven't talked about before. You learned earlier that there's these things called promoters, and at the end there's things called terminators that tell us when to start and when to stop. That's fine. Operons have an extra sequence called an operator, which, as its name implies, it operates things, it tells things when to start or when to stop as well. And so we get to learn two what we call classic operons. There's tons more, but these are the ones that kind of exemplify what bacteria do with these things. They're really, really cool. Okay. So what you're gonna see is one large gene, uh, one large piece of DNA, I'm sorry, controlled with one promoter sequence, one operator sequence, and a bunch of little genes all side by side. And what's gonna happen is, if you turn this on or turn this off, you'll make all four genes at the same time, instead of one by one like we normally do. So let's look at both examples first, and probably the most infamous of them all is something called the LAC operon, which stands for lactose. Yeah, that sugar that everybody's familiar with, okay? Lactose, is what we call an, uh, an inducible operon, meaning we turn it on. And so the lactose operon, believe it or not, is actually turned off, meaning we induce it, we turn it on, right? And it's turned off because it's blocked. There's this little protein called the repressor and it's keeping it from working. So basically it has a little security guard attached to it, saying, no, it's not gonna work. And so that operator controlling that prevents this operon from working. It's shutting it down. Now that operon has three genes, three proteins that can be made from it, all designed to transport and use the sugar lactose. So you need three proteins for this, but they're all shut down by this operator. Now, what's the big deal? Let's show this to you more visually appealing, um, uh, in a visually appealing manner, is here you have the three genes. They're all involved in bringing in, destroying lactose for energy. One, two, three. Now, if you make these, that means you can process lactose. If you don't make these, you can't process lactose. That's the short version of that story. Now, most of the time, these are blocked. There's this little protein, this operator, over here, this repressor, keeping it from working. Meaning that, for example, a ribosome can't come over here and read it, or your RNA polymerase, more than anything else, can't get in here and make these RNAs. Why? Well, the idea is actually kind of cool. 
Our main source of energy in this world is glucose. We all survive on glucose, the main carbohydrate of most life. Lactose, kind of like glucose, but not as good. So we normally consume glucose as long as it's available. As long as there's some bread, some plants to chew on, that kind of thing, we'll have some glucose. But what happens if it's not available? Well, if it's not available in this case, then you need to find another source for food. Lactose is a good source for food when glucose is not available. But you're not going to waste your time and energy making those things that you uh, need for it if you have free glucose hanging around. Why build something you don't need? That's the premise of the opera. Now, this is going to pop up immediately, and I already just saw it happen. It happens every single time. People associate this with lactose intolerance. Not quite. Remember, a human is lactose intolerant. This is a bacterium. This only occurs in prokaryotes. But the idea is exactly that. E. coli, for example, which does possess this lac operon, does that it specifically affect. If it needs lactose and it doesn't have any other sources of sugar, it'll activate or induce this operon, turn it on, and produce the genes required to process lactose. If it doesn't need the lactose, if, it's, if there's glucose present, it doesn't turn this on at all. Now the intolerance is very similar to this, in which certain humans, by having the correct microbiome inside of them, may or may not be able to process lactose when it's present. The ones that do possess this operon can process that lactose, and their bacteria are usually happy. The organisms that don't possess this can't process that lactose, and therefore leads to this uh, extra effect of additional amounts of gas being produced. And what ends up happening is certain ion, uh, ion chains inside the intestinal tract can't handle it, they go a little crazy and start releasing lots and lots of fluid. And I'm sure you know what that means. You have to run to the bathroom a lot, okay? So that's kind of that relationship. And no, this is not a human thing, this is a bacterial thing. Organisms that are able to process this uh, particular sugar. Now, why is this a big deal? So let me kind of go back to the, uh, the actual notes. Remember, the lac operon is always off. You can only turn it on. You're, you can induce it. And the reason behind this is because you don't want to waste time or energy. But what if you need it? Well, the idea behind this, in order for to turn it on, two key events need to exist. Not only do you have to have lactose available for you, but you also have to have no glucose present. In other words, if there's sugar, good sugar around us, good old glucose present for us, there's no need for this operon to be turned on. You have food available for you. Don't waste the energy. So there's two key events. If glucose is gone, so there's no basic food, but there happens to be secondary food available, lactose in this case, a series of processes occur that allow us to track a little bit of energy and a couple of other proteins that then lead to the production of that operon, turning it on. So what does that look like? Well, in the event that there's lactose, which is this little guy that you're seeing over here in green, um, it will actually interact with that repressor that was blocking the operator and then it'll allow the production of all three proteins that you need to process in lactose, okay? So how does this work so that it makes a little bit more sense to everybody? So I'm gonna kind of switch off to my slides to my other presentation version really quick. Get this guy going here. Hit the switch slides. Here. Can everybody see the blank screen? Excellent. So think about it this way. I'm gonna try and doodle this so I'm not staying very well at the screen. Remember, you have a chunk of DNA and then from it, you're supposed to put, 
pull out little pieces of RNA and that each individual one of those eventually gives you one protein. That's how we work. That's how most uh, mammals, most eukaryotes work. Bacteria, on the other hand, have their little chunk of DNA. However, they actually control those genes all in one shot. So they put them all together, basically side by side. So that collection is called an operon. And that collection usually gets messed with by a little sequence called an operator. So now what happens is that normally you can turn on transcription from the promoter and you can turn it off from the terminator. That's what we already learned. However, that would normally just happen very easily. You turn it on and you'd make your protein. But if there's somebody in your way, kind of blocking this all off, something right here preventing you from going through, you can't make those proteins. That's what an operon does. It's something controlled by an additional control mechanism called an operator. Now what's so neat about this is that we have one particular case in which we have this operon that is designed to process lactose. So it helps us eat lactose, basically. Well, it helps bacteria eat lactose, I should say. Right? And so there's three proteins. One, two, three that it can make. In other words, this operon would produce three little RNAs that eventually would produce three different little proteins. And all three of these take lactose, and produce it, produce energy from it. That's what it does. But the problem is, this is costly. This takes a lot of energy and materials and resources. So what you wanna do, in this case is control it with something called an operator. Basically, it turns it off. Saying we don't need any of this unless we're starving. We don't need to waste any energy, any time or anything for this if we don't need food. So the trigger is simple. Let me go back. If there's glucose present, then the operon is off. You have food. You don't need to waste your time and energy on this stuff. Now, if glucose is not present, the operon is still off. There's no need to turn it on if you don't have any use for it. The only time you turn this operon on, the only time you induce it, meaning you induce it here, so you turn it on, is if there's lactose present. And the key feature is that it has to be both. You have to have both of these cases available to turn it on. Otherwise, if you have no lactose present, there's no point in turning this operon on either. And so that's what this pretty picture shows you. Let me switch off over here. That's what this is showing you, just a little better drawings than mine, right? So you have this long sequence with three proteins all designed to process lactose, but it's always off thanks to this repressor. And you only turn it on when you run out of glucose, when you run out of your main food, and there's lactose present. So two conditions need to exist for this. You need to have glucose gone and lactose present. That's how you turn this lactose. Now, 
There's a similar version to this called the trip operon. And the trip operon is the reverse of the other one. This is called the tryptophan operon or tryptophan operon, in which this is in charge of amino acid tryptophan. Okay. The idea here is simple. This is an operon that involves five genes. It's a bigger one. And those five genes produce five different proteins, all involved in just doing one thing, building amino acid tryptophan. That's it. That's all it does. Five different proteins, five different sequences, all involved in creating one amino acid. Seems a little extreme that five entire proteins full of thousands and thousands of amino acids all needed to produce one amino acid. So again, what do you do to control this? Well, tryptophan happens to be one of those essential amino acids that you have to consume or you die. What happens if you run out? What if there's no tryptophan? Well, the unique thing about this operon is that it's always blocked and you'll only turn it on in this case when there's no tryptophan available so if there's no amino acid floating around all five of these proteins are active and making tryptophan the second you have enough tryptophan that tryptophan blocks and gets in that operator and shuts this whole thing down so very similar to the lactose operon, just in reverse. This one is making stuff and it gets shut down in the presence of its needed substance. The lactose one is in reverse. Um, to answer the question in terms of these being turned on or technically turned off um, in other situations, no. What's critical about these are those operators. That's the whole point behind operons is that they're always either shut down or always turned on and that they're tightly regulated or tightly controlled to prevent these from wasting time and energy. So if the conditions are not met, these do not work basically. So the lac operon will not turn on when uh, glucose is present and even if lactose is around, it will not turn itself on. It has to have both of these uh, conditions that glucose is absent and lactose is present, or in the case of the trip, offer on same idea. It will not turn on, it will keep itself shut off as long as there's tryptophan floating around. If it's off, I mean, if it's absent, then this whole thing turns off. Lack of operon is inducible, meaning we turn it on when we need it. Uh, the trip offer on is repressible. This guy is always on unless we don't need it and it shuts itself off. So this is one of the unique features of bacteria and their control. Now the final slide I'm gonna show before we go on a quick break is that you can actually control these doing some very interesting things. Protein expression regulates it, transcriptional uh, expression also regulates everything, but there's other cool ways to control proteins. One of the really neat ways to do this that happens in eukaryotes and viruses do this is, and this is what led to the discoveries of things like CRISPR that probably some of you have heard, is something called an RNA-induced silencing complex in which there's tiny little chunks of RNA, tiny little bits, like a couple of uh, dozen nucleotides long, very, very tiny. So these are referred to usually as micro-RNAs. And so what they do is that they mess with uh, RNAs being made and prevent the proteins being made later. So they interfere with protein expression. There are synthetic versions of these that we can create that kind of create double-strand RNA and then therefore prevent ribosomes from attaching called small interfering RNAs or siRNAs. And this is the process of creating new drugs here that interfere with RNAs to treat certain diseases. And even further, there's other cool ways called the riboswitches in which certain organisms like prokaryotes and uh, certain plants and certain shrooms can create RNA control based on their environment alone. Meaning that they'll turn things on or off based on whether it's too hot, too cold, or it's wet, 
it's dry, and so on and so forth. So humans, it's called you know an AC unit that you turn on and off to control your temperature. Most of the time when you can't handle it, plants have their own integrated versions of producing proteins to do so. So there's all these other ways of regulating this. We're just basically looking at the tip of the iceberg right now, okay? So let's pause here briefly. So why the images, right? Why is it that we're asking silly little things? Is that unfortunately the term mutation has also been one of those words, kind of like radiation and radioactivity and even the word chemicals have been bastardized into meaning things that they do not mean. And so thanks to this wonderful world currently of sci-fi and really crappy storytelling like all the Marvel movies, yes, I said it, um, I'm a DC fan for life, just so you guys know. Um, is that anytime somebody says mutation, they just automatically assume the worst things. And it's gone to the point in which people think like, I don't know, think about every horrible Marvel movie from like Spider-Man to the Hulk to um, all the X-Men movies and things like that. They go, oh, well, this is a mutation. And suddenly somebody has superpowers and they're flying around everywhere, and nothing could be further from the case. And if it's not that rate, it turns into some sort of horrible monster, you know, some weird hellish spawn kind of thing that's chasing you and trying to kill you and makes great, you know, Halloween movies. Problem is, nothing can be further from the truth. Mutation, by definition, is a very simple one. It has nothing to do with the creatures that you can imagine or your uh, people are promoting when somebody goes, oh, it's a mutation. That's not really it. As a matter of fact, we know the mutation as well as for evolution, they have a very strong force to drive things towards improvement, not necessarily to create something with seven arms or 55 legs or unfortunately tiger bunny over here. So let's get into actual definitions of what we wanna talk about here, right? So let's get this guy going. There we go. So we've looked at the central dogma and we did the whole DNA, RNA, protein. We did the replication, transcription, translation. And that's kind of our cycle, right? The idea is that there's this source and origin and order of how genetics works. And if we kind of take a look at briefly in terms of a human, for example, how mutation works, remember that humans are roughly about 3 billion bases of A's, G's, T's, and C's, right? And we have about 25,000 genes and about 150,000 proteins. And there's huge amounts of variations in the sizes of those, right? Now, believe it or not, for humans at least, we're about 99.9193 or so uh, amounts of similarity between all our cells, all our genes across the board. So between you and your neighbor and your friend, everybody outside in the rest of the world, myself included here, 99.91 to 93 or so percent identical. So there's a very, very small amount or small percentage of our genes, of our bases, of our A's, C's, T's, and G's that are different. Now, as the world is improving, we know about a good two thirds to maybe about three fourths of those genes now, thanks to science, but we don't know them all still. We're still kind of working on that. We've kind of uh, isolated all of them, but we really don't know what they all do. Now, the story behind today is kind of interesting because remember that your blueprint is what dictates how things work, right? And you all know already that if you don't have the correct set of instructions, some really horrible things can happen. In other words, if you don't follow the directions correctly, or if the directions themselves are not done correctly or not stipulated or explained correctly, bad things are gonna happen, right? So just like anything else. So why can they become useful and definitely not give you superpowers? So I'm going to move on to a topic that kind of I ask you, most of you to participate. And if you can't recognize the uh, gentleman that is placed up here, 
I strongly encourage you to look into some more American literature. Um, what we have here is one of my favorite uh, comic strips out there. And the idea here is that we have a gentleman named as Calvin. And the reason why I like Calvin is because he's extremely expressive. And what I usually make fun of here is people's faces. You all know that despite the fact that you're all humans, and you all have a head, two eyeballs, a mouth, a nose, and ears, every single one of you has them, right? There's just tiny little variations that kind of make you look different. That's it. And so again, the expressiveness between this guy and your face and your significant other's face, your child's face, your best friend's face, and so on and so forth, is just tiny little changes. And those tiny little changes in there are within that 0.09% difference that we all exist. And those 0.09 differences, or percent differences, I'm sorry, is what makes you, you. It's what makes you different. And so those mutations have allowed you to have uh, slightly longer hair, slightly curlier hair, slightly taller, slightly shorter, slightly lighter skin, slightly darker skin, all that stuff. That's what that 0.09% is. The rest is identical. Your muscle inside of you is not any different than anybody else's muscle. Your bone, your blood, virtually almost identical with the exception of that 0.09% or so. So why is that important to us? Because thanks to those changes, thanks to that 0.09% is what's made us unique. That's what's made us different and allowed us to survive. And so when people teach about mutation, um, as opposed to tell you about mutation, which is what you see in the media, is that mutation, believe it or not, is a very simple definition. A mutation, by definition, is just any difference from the original sequence. That's it. It doesn't say good, it doesn't say bad, it doesn't say monster, it doesn't say superpowers, right? You know, it doesn't imply some sort of horrible things about to happen. All it is, is any change from the original sequence. That's it. Okay? So, let's kind of expand upon this and just kind of give you an idea why this is important. How does this actually work? Now, when we talk about mutations in our class, we kind of divide them into big ones and small ones. We call these large mutations that involve high amounts of sequences, or what we call point mutations, in which we have just one little letter being affected, one little nucleotide. Now, when we were talking about proteins earlier, and we were talking about translation, we told you that we read things in codons, three letters at a time, right? Hence, like we saw that AUG that gave us methionine and so on and so forth. Now, I can give you a series of letters just like you had before. And you know that you can actually make sense of it because you know more or less punctuation. You know when to start reading, you know when to stop reading, and you know how to read it, meaning you have the guidelines and the instructions on how to make sense out of something. Now, technically, that sequence that I'm showing up there is just a jumble of letters. It really is. You make sense out of those letters because you know how to read it. But what if you shift the way on how to read that specific frame? In other words, if I don't tell you technically when to, where to start or where to end, that sentence might not make any sense at all. And so I'm giving you some examples up there. And this is the important part. Mutations usually change the way on how we read things. So you could be reading a book and if suddenly there's no comma, there's no you know, punctuation marks, there's no exclamations, no nothing, not gonna make a lot of sense. Same idea applies here. Your DNA sequence, your RNA sequence, your codons only make sense because we know where to start and where to end. And more than anything else, we know that we get to read them three letters at a time and we know what each three sets of letters mean. So what happens when we mess with them, right? Well, we can look at the large versions, which are fairly simplistic to understand. We can pretend that, for example, we have a large chromosome over there that is consisting of six little regions, if you want to take a look at them. Um, I've colored them there and this cool little rainbow. And pretend that our chromosome up there has six regions, A, B, C, D, E, and F. 
fairly straightforward, right? Let me turn on my pointer over here. A, B, C, D, and F. What if you would happen to delete one of those regions, a large chunk of this? I want you to understand what this means. You know, we lost region B over here. That's a large chunk. And what I mean by large, I want you to understand. You have 25,000 genes. You have about 23 chromosomes. So if you want to do the math very simplistically, you have roughly about 1,000 genes per chromosome. Not that that's accurate, just I want you to get an idea. If there's a thousand genes, a thousand little codes, a thousand little books inside that one chromosome that we have up here, and if you were to delete region B right there that I'm pointing at, you'd end up losing about 130, 140 different genes. If missing one gene can usually kill you, what do you think 130, 140 genes missing, what happened to you? This is automatically insta-death. There's very few instances in which we can end up missing chunks of these and not kill you, just so you know. What if you doubled it? All right, what if you just duplicate it? Like, ah, more is better. Not necessarily. What if those genes are involved in producing something that the, you don't use a lot? Let me kind of oversimplify it. Let's just say that that region over there, that region B, codes for building a nose. Let's just make it up as we will. Now you have twice of that. What do you think would happen to your nose? I'll let you envision that for a second, right? You can just kind of imagine uh, an, an X-Men with two noses or a super large nose and has extremely sensitive smell. I don't know, I'm just making this up as we go along. So duplicating a, a good chunk of genes is not a good thing, a good thing either. What if you swap them? What if you just change them in position? This is a process known as either inversion or an even crazier one called translocation and trading them off. Well, remember that B encoded our nose, for example, and let's just say that part E encoded making toes and feet or something. Well, if you trade them, you still have those genes. It's not like you're missing them. But remember, your polymerases, all your enzymes, your histone, all this good stuff that helps you make more of itself, read it, doesn't know that it switched spots. So now when you should be building a toe, now you're building a nose. You know, it sounds as silly and as simplistic as I'm doing that. Position matters too. So most of these things end up being almost lethal most of the time. Missing genes, missing this many chunks of chromosomes, missing pieces of these things that are functional for you are most of the time lethal. This is what normally is referred to as a natural abortion, for example. Most pregnancies when they're uh, going through, um, early on our body can actually detect these things and going, look, we're not going to be able to produce a nose. We're not going to be able to produce feet. And then the body naturally will actually select this and start necrotizing and destroying those cells. This is a, a referred to as a natural abortion, for example, one of those versions of control. Now that's for AMP now for us. But let's look at it at the more smaller scale. Let's look at it from the point of view of one letter just changing, not hundreds, not thousands, not genes, all that, just one letter, okay? This is what we call a point mutation. So here I'm giving you a quick frame to read with four little codons, very simplistic, right? And normally, let's just say that our DNA is supposed to look like this. It's supposed to say ATG, TTG, ATT, and TGA. I'm reading this fast, so it's not really relevant. What if you just substitute one of them? Just switch them off. It was supposed to be a T, now it became an A. What do you think that would do? What if you just accidentally throw an extra letter in there? An extra base? You notice that the frame just shifted on how you read things. Normally, you were meant to read TTG and ATT. Now, you're reading completely different patterns of codons. Same thing would happen if you deleted one. The frame would shift to the left in this case, and you end up reading different things. So just one base can also cause the same type of problems. So let's focus on these. Let's pretend we're going to have that codon wheel for you to available. There's that same code that I just gave you, right? And when it becomes RNA, when you actually transcribe it, the only thing that really changes are the U's. The T's and the U's get swapped off. 
it's fairly straightforward. But let's turn these into a protein. Well, if we look at the codons, we have that AUG, we know that A, U, and G give us methionine. The letters U, U, and G, U, U, G gives us leucine, and so on and so forth. And so we have a primary sequence there, no matter the order of the amino acids. Pretty simplistic. That's kind of what would work in a very simplistic kind of way. But what happens if you actually change one of those? Okay, so for example, we have that code, there's the ATG, TTG, and so on and so forth. What if we accidentally swap that letter and our polymerase screw that up and put by mistake an A? Now, what would happen is that instead of being our RNA being UUG, now it became UUA. What type of thing would it change? Well, in reality, believe it or not, UUG and UUA happen to play the same amino acid. So it really didn't change our sequence. In other words, our protein that we made is just fine. This is commonly referred to as a silent mutation, in which even though there was a mutation, there was a change from the original sequence, it didn't really have a functional impact. Nothing happened to you, basically. Okay, We got the same amino acid, and all is well. Now, the mutation still existed, it just didn't have a drastic effect. So we call it a silence mutation. Now, the interesting thing is that this only typically works really well at that last letter. So when we were looking learning about proteins, remember we talked about this wobble effect, that redundancy, that's where this comes into play. Now, what if this is not the case? What if it's not at the end of the codon? What if it doesn't occur just in that last letter? What if we were to change the sequence and change it into a uh, GAA, to AA, sorry, to a GUA, for example. Something fairly basic, right? Well, now the original amino acid that was used to be glutamic acid now got changed into valine. In other words, you actually change the protein. Okay? So these are called missense mutations. The original sense of it got changed. There's a mistake. So let me give you one of the most common missense mutations that does yield a live product. Probably the most infamous of them all is sickle cell anemia. That by changing that GAA to GUA now causes a malformation of the cell, uh, red blood cells. It causes these proteins not to bend very well and so it causes these really weird folds and so therefore it causes the structure of the red blood cells to kind of form in half. Like a little sickle, hence the, uh, the term that you've heard before. So now we don't get that pretty little donut look. We get this kind of half cell kind of shape. All caused by one base. There's no superpower here. You didn't get to fly because of this. All you have is now anemia. Your ability to carry oxygen and transport it to the places it's needed is now severely hindered. You've lost volume in your blood cell. Now you can't deliver uh, sorry, oxygen very well. That's one example, but you know, you can live with it. But what if instead of that happening to that particular protein, it happened to, for example, something that helps you make skin? These cases mostly are lethal. Can't quite really survive without skin, can we? You know, this whole idea of this barrier that protects us from the outside. So in this case, this child managed to make it to the age of six surviving under extreme conditions. Your flesh, constantly exposed to bacteria, to infections. Imagine the pain associated with this. All caused by one letter, one base, one A for one U. That's it. Hence why this is lethal. Hence why natural abortions are essential. This is not something that we fight. Go crazy on, you know, abortions by means of uh, birth control. That's a whole different thing. This is natural. This is essential. Do you really want to wish this upon anybody? Would that be your child, your friend? These are important things. This is why it's important to actually um, repair. This is why the spell checking is important.
And that is correct. They are missing their feet. In this case, they're missing their toes and stuff like that. It's extreme. So, but I want to kind of show you the differences between one case that is livable and the other one, it's just not worth living almost, right? So this is very important for you to understand what mutation does. Most of these things are lethal because you can't survive with them. This is why we don't fly. This is why we don't have wings. Nat uh, nature, evolution selects for these things. This is not a viable subject. So they we're not gonna pass these genes on, it becomes lethal automatically. So you have to understand how important this is. It's not a matter of you know, superpowers. Now there is one final level behind this in which sometimes when you're creating your code, you accidentally introduce a change in that mutation, that point mutation, and you accidentally introduce a stop, meaning you change the length of your protein. So instead of making the whole protein, you truncate it. You cut it short. So this is what we call, in this case, that shift as a nonsense mutation. The term non here meaning that it's no longer produced completely. And there's plenty of diseases out there to do that. Uh, certain types of acromegalies, certain types of cystic fibrosis, um, certain versions of diabetes, for example, all have this because the proteins are not made fully. They got kind of cut short a little bit. And so now the entire body of the protein is not made. And so therefore there's a limit in the function themselves. That's where this comes into play. So with that being said, those are still uh, the typical three part parts of our uh, mutations that we wanted to highlight. Now, what causes those mutations? What can trigger them? Well, most of the time, we kind of spell check, right? We can take care of these types of concerns. But there's plenty of ways to cause them or trigger them or to at least increase your chances for this to happen, right? So, for example, let's see if I can get this guy going. Sometimes it happens spontaneously. So, in other words, during replication, you just introduce wrong letters, incorrect bases. Sometimes in the repair, sometimes we don't repair it correctly as well. That can happen, believe it or not, right? And sometimes uh, during processes of recombination, which we'll look at a little bit later, we can actually mix up some of those genes or some of those sequences and cause issues. But more often than not, uh, a lot of the mutation comes to what we call artificial mutation meaning something else external to us causes that, something else triggers it. And so there's two versions of this, what we call physical mutations, physical properties trigger this, or what we call chemical mutations that are usually caused by substances, okay? And so reminding you again that your polymerases proofread, they spell check, right? And they lower the chances of mutations Mutagens, the term that uh, we use for substances or uh, properties that cause mutation, usually increase that rate anywhere between tenfold to thousands of times uh, at a higher rate. So that means lots more mutations present. And so back to this concept of a natural abortion, for example, that's what evolution does, is that this idea is that if we know that it's a bad effect, it'll automatically select it out to prevent that gene or those genes being mutated from being passed on into future generations. In other words, we prevent them from going any further. So under the physical category of mutations, probably most of you are familiar with the most basic ones of them all, uh, what we call ionizing and non-ionizing radiations. And these are your classic X-rays and UV rays and things like that. And the reason behind this is that these guys usually introduce some sort of damage to our A's, G's, T's, C's, and U's, preventing them from doing their job. Uh, substances that can cause these mutations, mutagens in this case, can do something similar, but instead they usually actually replace or alter the actual bodies or shapes of the nucleotides themselves. In other words, they're no longer A's, G's, T's, and C's, and U's. They, use them some, uh, they replace them with something different. But let's kind of give you an example. 
UV light, which is probably the most common one that everybody is familiar with, um, UV light, so sitting under the sun more than 15 minutes directly under the beam of light, causes something we call uh, pyrimidine dimers. What it happens is that so much uh, UV light, it causes the actual letters T or thymines to double bond together. And they introduce these weird little bumps into our DNA sequences. And so those bumps prevent our polymerase from reading it correctly and they introduce mistakes. So since they can't quite read that correctly, since it doesn't know what it's reading, it doesn't know how to follow it, it introduces the wrong basis. And in that case, triggering mutations. Substances, on the other hand, so mutagens, chemical mutagens, act like bases. And so, for example, we can pretend to have synthetic versions of those nucleotides and introduce them as well, causing, for example, the polymerases to misread what they're uh, looking at and introduce incorrect bases. So uh, analogs, uh, nucleotide analogs, are also a common form of drugs. We actually create these guys as a way to treat certain diseases to increase the rates of mutations in bacteria and viruses so that they die off early. So there are ways to kind of increase the rate of this. Now, one of the common subjects that I'm just going to introduce lightly um, is the fact that we can alter the sequences as well. And so our ability to introduce changes into the original sequences is now an entire field in biology that we know as genetic recombination. In other words, we actually change the sequences, we exchange those nucleotides by certain types of uh, procedures and protocols, right? Uh, one of the most common ones that exists out there is called horizontal gene transfer. So this is part one for it, just so you know. Um, and the idea here is uh, we com commonly refer to this as transformation in which we can introduce original or new pieces of DNA, external DNA, a term we call exogenous DNA, right? And we can allow certain cells to kind of suck it in, to soak it in by giving them a certain types of protocols. We call these competent cells in case you're wondering. And so there's lots of experiments out there. There's most historical ones, uh, for, which are known as the Griffith experiments, in which we took uh, uh, version of strep in this case and with some exogenous pieces of DNA we actually introduce new properties we allow these cells to gain new powers basically so kind of this idea of like the plasmids that's kind of where that came from now there's a different version called transduction in which we can use viruses for example that we've manipulated we've tweaked more or less and they can actually inject their genome or whatever we put in there to pass it on to cells, right? Normally viruses get in, hijack the system and kill the cell. Here, we can actually tweak what's inside the virus and have those viruses deliver what we want. And so this is known as transduction. And this is actually a huge field in drug design in which the idea is that we can use empty shells of viruses and instead of giving them all the bad stuff, we put in good stuff in there, if you will. And we have those infect people as a way to introduce vaccines or other drugs to treat certain diseases. And probably the one we were talking about before, I talked about F plasmids, this concept of conjugation in which cells construct these pyloses, thanks to the plasmid F, and so they can pass on this ability to transfer information or transfer plasmids. So these are referred to as F positive or F negatives as our way of saying that cells that have the plasmid or not. And so what's really neat about this is that we've exploited that concept in which we can take cells that have these F plasmids and we can actually introduce genes, DNA that we want to be passed on. And so we can actually control the information that is present within these cells and pass it on to others. So this is part of what we call recombinant DNA technology. And probably what most of you have heard in the long run and a very interesting version of this on how we generate genetically modified organisms. So this is just done artificially in the lab, right? Now the final little piece that I'm gonna talk about in terms of changing genes and introducing mutations and new sequences is kind of a little weird one out there called transposition. And this is kind of really neat because 
sequences in our cells, in all organisms, have a tendency of jumping, then that's the best term we can describe. Uh, sequences, referred to as transposons, have a tendency of being able to kind of remove themselves from one place in the genome and move to another place. They're literally jumping. And so with the help of certain proteins, they can actually kind of cut themselves out and move themselves to a different place, which makes them very unique. Now, the problem with that is that we can start now moving these guys and introducing new sequences as well as new properties to where they're moving. So transposons are not necessarily always great, but a good pro, uh, portion of our bodies, of our genomes, have actually grown because of that. So it's actually kind of an interesting concept. So back to topic A really quick, and to kind of show you why this is unique to understand, is that, for example, part of that biotechnology that we were talking about before and bioremediation, that's what we've done. We've taken advantage of genetic recombination or of, of our ability to introduce new sequences into bacteria and turn them into uh, biorecyclers, for example. We have organisms that we can introduce certain genes and certain abilities to help us recycle oil spills and break down you know, used paper and so on and so forth. Even better by understanding this concept of recombination is as we'll look at a little bit later when we look at it into HIV um, and a couple of cool little neat pieces, uh, another organism called Thermos aquaticus that has this ability to uh, survive under really high temperatures we managed to combine these ideas like a virus and its ability to uh, reverse transcribe certain things and the ability of this other organism to resist, resist heat and now use them in the labs as a way to perform uh, tests under certain conditions that normally were not available. And probably combining with this is probably my favorite portion is the immune system of bacteria. Bacteria have their own way of defending themselves too. And one of the ways they do this is by cutting DNA and RNA. These are called restriction endonucleases. These proteins recognize foreign DNA and they just chop it up. That's all they do. It's a pretty neat kind of concept. Now, why is that important to us? Is because when they do this, they kind of introduce these really weird kind of ends when they're cutting off the DNA. And so when they do that, believe it or not, we can actually reassemble them. And so what we've done is take advantage of how strange their bacterial system is, for example, their immune system, and learn how to piece things together. That's the kind of concept of genetic recombination. The idea of taking DNA from one organism or something slightly related and put it together with a different one. That's kind of the really neat effect. So in other words, we can genetically recombine and produce new plasmids and produce new effects. So this is how we create drug design. This is how we have bacteria create dyes. And this is how now insulin is produced. And as opposed to, for example, killing thousands and thousands and thousands of poor little pigs just so we can have one little shot of insulin, now E. coli can do that in a matter of hours. So this is the beauty behind this system. So mutation is not all that bad, nor is it all as hyped as you think. And as long as we understand how the system works, we can actually take advantage of it and produce beneficial effects from them. All right. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So we'll stop here for the moment.